Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we are getting into the full story of the Avengers Assemble Multiversal War. And if you love multiversal variants, you definitely come to the right place because this story is packed with them. But in its entirety, this story is a continuation of Heroes Reborn and the Death Hunters. In both of those videos, I have linked in the description just below the like button course, but in this continuation, we'll be covering the conclusion of Jason Aaron's 2018 Avengers series, along with Avengers Forever Volume 2 in its entirety, and the Avengers Assemble event in its entirety. So if you're someone who is wondering whatever happened to the Doom Above All and the Masters of Evil, the Avengers 1 million BC, or Mephisto and his Council of Red, it all comes together here, all because of one particular person that was the worst villain in his universe, who was destined to become the greatest Avenger in the multiverse. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squat up in the comments. All right, so with getting into Avengers Forever, this immediately jumps back into the executions that have been dished out by the Doom Above All, along with the team that he had assembled called the Multiversal Masters of Evil. And initially, this takes us to Earth 818, where the Masters of Evil are just slaughtering the Avengers 1 million BC of this world, which like we've seen before, that this is pretty much their plan. Travel the multiverse and arrive on these different Earths 1 million years in the past, kill their version of the Avengers 1 million BC, and after that, any of the Masters of Evil can shape this world any way that they want to, with the Avengers 1 million BC out of the way. And really it's here with us going to Earth 818 where we get a crazy example of how that plays out. But first, with us returning back to Earth 818, we find that the Odin of their Avengers 1 million BC is still hanging on to life moments after the attack from the Multiversal Masters of Evil, after they had left. And it's in this moment where we get to know a bit more about Odin from Earth 818, because for this Odin, his son had died as a result of a stillbirth. And then soon after, this Odin had taken on humanity as an adopted race that would eventually go on to live alongside of the gods. But with the Masters of Evil destroying the prehistoric Avengers of Earth 818, this has now prohibited Odin's dream from becoming a reality. And it's for this reason that with his dying breath, he puts one last enchantment on his hammer, telling it to avenge them all. And with this happening, we then see that the hammer's inscription reads, Whosoever holds this hammer, if they be worthy, shall possess the power of all vengeance. And after this, we then jump forward to present day on Earth 818, where we find that its new, twisted future has taken hold. And it's here where we jump in with Ant-Man, who's being chased by a number of Venomants. More on that later. But as it turns out, the Ant-Man of Earth 818 is actually Tony Stark, who had designed at one point a full suit of armor, but then he was like, hey, that's too much work. So instead, he just created a tiny prototype ant that goes by the name of Shellhead. And I mean, I'm not sure if that was much easier, but that was the decision that he made, living in a world that's very different that led him on a path to become an Ant-Man. But in addition to this, he's also an archaeologist, in a world where it's illegal to look up the past for obvious reasons. But with his obsession of the past, this led him to collecting items from the prehistoric age, which he knows is a time when the world had more promise and potential. But as Tony's running out of time, with these Venom Ants closing in, he then pulls out his Nowhere Gun, which is made from the head of a Celestial that he'd found at the bottom of a North Pole volcano. And with how this is done, it almost seems like this Nowhere Gun is actually the head of the Progenitor. But of course, with Tony using his Nowhere Gun, it's enough to get the Venom Ants off of him, as Shellhead makes his way back soon after, when the danger's gone and the hard work is done, of course. And after this, Tony then hops on top of Shellhead to continue his search for what he believes is the only hope for survival, buried amongst the skulls of gods. And with him continuing to dig, it's here where he comes across Odin's Mjolnir. After hearing ghosts of a million years past, whispering to him, avenge me, avenge us all. So he grows to his regular size and he goes to lift it. And for a moment, he actually does. But then the hammer just goes crazy, throwing lightning all over the place only to then get extremely heavy and fall right on top of him. But then fortunately, he's able to think quick with the hammer getting lower and lower with every breath. So he shrinks himself down so that he can get out from underneath it. But then now, since he can't continue to hold the hammer, he just gets Shellhead to cut out the ground from around it to where then he shrinks the hammer down so that they can scoop it up and just take it with them. But as they get ready to leave, just outside, there's a ton of war machines searching the wasteland trying to find them. And with Tony seeing them out there, it's here where we discover by him more or less just thinking to himself that he had in fact designed these war machines back when he got caught looting the tomb of the Fist of Khonshu, when at the time, Waste Lord locked him in a cave 
and tortured Tony until he built everything the Waste Lord wanted. Until some time later when he was locked away in a war machine prison where Tony then focused on making himself disappear by making himself physically as small as he felt. And it was then when Tony had eventually discovered the Stark Particles and the rest is history. But while these war machines are surveying the area, suddenly they get a priority alert which causes them to leave Tony Stark and head towards the more dangerous threat. But as soon as these war machines make their way to find what this priority threat is, they are quickly caught lacking by Robbie Reyes, the Omni Avenger who has come here to seek multiversal vengeance. And so now, I'm sure to most people, just seeing 616 Robbie Reyes just popping up here might seem kind of random. And if it does, it's okay, because we are dealing with Jason Aaron's Avengers here. But with Robbie Reyes showing up here, this is actually a continuation from our talk on Avengers The Death Hunters, when at the time, early in that story, in Avengers issue 750, Robbie had been having Hellfire migraines, which eventually activated his multiversal vengeance and in a pillar of multiversal Hellfire. This took Robbie in a nearby deathlock over to Earth 818, and I got the link below in case you need to go back and get caught up on the rest of that story. But it's here where we jump in with Robbie Reyes alongside the deathlock as they're attempting to save some wastelanders who are being transported via train. And Robbie ends up stopping this train by jumping out of his charger and through the train's engine. And after doing that, he just wrecks a ton of these war machines. And it's kinda like, man, what you got against war machines? But even with Robbie just wrecking these guys, there's still a number of them left over who he serves penance to. And aside from him stopping these guys, the Deathlock reminds Robbie that they don't have all day to just sit here because there's a ton of other war machines coming. And the Wastelanders who are being transported, they can't just let them go free because they have nowhere to go for miles. But with time running short, Robbie thinks quick and he chains the rest of this train to the back of his charger and he takes off with close to a few dozen other war machines going after them. But with him doing this, this would be a good idea in just about any other universe. But the problem here is that they really have nowhere to go. And the Deathlock tells this to Robbie because he's trying to figure out what's the plan. Because this entire world is pretty much a prison. But for Robbie at this point, he's just figuring this out as he goes. And he tells the Deathlock that there has to be someone else out there, like them. There must be other Avengers. But while they're being chased from a distance, Earth 818 Tony Stark, he sees them passing because he had to know what these war machines were going after. And when he sees this chaos in passing, he knows that that has to be a Ghost Rider. But unfortunately, moments later, Robbie doesn't get too far because the craziest barricade of war machines that you could imagine stops them up ahead. And from among these war machines, the Waste Lord of this Earth steps out and it's none other than the Black Skull. Because if you guys remember, back when the Doom Above All assembled the Masters of Evil, he had made a deal with each of them where he would allow them to keep a world across the multiverse to themselves, more or less like a form of payment. And as it turns out, Earth 818 now belongs to the Black Skull. And with Robbie and the Deathlock running right into him, he then takes the two of them as his prisoners. But then it's from here where we go back to Tony Stark, as he heads back to his Ant Hill base in the Wastelands. And when he gets there, he places Odin's hammer with the rest of his collection of prehistoric artifacts and he calls for his team to gather around or more or less assemble so that he can fill them in. Because not only has he finally found Odin's hammer, but he's also possibly found the last piece to the puzzle that they've been looking for, with him seeing an actual Ghost Rider. Because this now gives them hope, which on Earth 818 is a word that's considered to be profanity. But with him sharing this with the others, it's here where we now see his team, which includes Earth 818 Vision, Infinity Thing, Wonder Man, and Moon Knight, Mariama Spectre. But now with Tony's new discovery, he believes that his world has a chance to no longer be one huge prison camp and be saved. Alright, so for this one, we pick back up with Robbie Reyes and the Deathlock, who we had recently seen attempt to be heroes and save some Wastelanders in a hopeless world, only to soon after it gets stopped in their tracks by this world's Waste Lord, the Black Skull, who had then shortly after taken in the two of them as his prisoners. But also recently, we're given a bit of insight from Earth 818's Tony Stark on what it's like to be a prisoner of the Waste Lord, who's someone we've actually known about for some time now as the Black Skull, who is an alternate version of the Red Skull with the Venom symbiote, who we originally seen back in Heroes Reborn. But it's here on Earth 818 where we were told by Tony Stark that the Black Skull likes to take prisoners and he loves torturing them, whether it's to get answers or to get them to do what he wants them to do. And it's when we jump back in here, we find that the Black Skull has taken both Robbie Reyes and the Deathlock to his main compound while keeping Robbie's charger chained up in the dungeon. But while they're here, we find that the Black Skull has given a lot of his attention to Robbie. 
because the Black Skull wants to know who Robbie is and where he came from since the Avengers of this world are supposed to be long gone. And with this interrogation, it gets pretty crazy because the Black Skull cuts off Robbie's right foot, which is the foot that he uses to stand up in the pedal and bust the dashboard. But even with the Black Skull going to this extreme, Robbie doesn't tell him anything. But when the Black Skull takes Robbie's foot and he tosses it to one of his guys telling him to fly it into the sun, Robbie's foot burns through this guy's soul. And as soon as this happens, Robbie takes the opportunity to attempt to escape only for the Black Skull to crush the hopes of that even happening. But also with doing this, the Black Skull lets Robbie in on a few things, because much like the Ghost Rider in his Charger, he's familiar to bonding himself with the power so great that he nearly loses himself in the process. And for the Black Skull, burning his soul with penance is useless, because he believes everything that he's done, even to the extreme of genocide, has all been for a righteous cause. And so there's no guilt, regret, or remorse in his heart and soul. Unlike Robbie's soul, who he says is still a bit mushy. And with the Black Skull asking Robbie again, who sent him throughout the multiverse. In response, Robbie just spits in his face, one sizzling high loogie, which right there just earns Robbie even more torture at the hands of the Black Skull, the big brawly spiky hands at that. But even still, much like earlier, Robbie refuses to make a sound, even with all the pain and agony that he's in, because he refuses to give the Black Skull the pleasure. But with Robbie doing this, it only keeps him in a daily cycle of getting tortured and getting thrown back in his cell with the Deathlock, only to do it all over again the next day. But with this Deathlock, who was sent from Avengers Prime to protect the remaining Avengers, which as we've seen with the other Deathlocks, they're not doing too good of a job. But it's here where he tries to encourage Robbie, more or less by letting him know that one, he can't fall asleep, because if Robbie does, he'll turn back to his human form. And in this mutilated condition, if he reverts back, he won't last long. And the Deathlock goes on to let Robbie know that he's traveled the multiverse and he's seen more worlds than there are roaches on this floor. And he knows that Robbie Reyes isn't like any other Ghost Rider that he's ever seen before. So Robbie has got to do his best to hold out by staying in his Ghost Rider form to prevent succumbing to these mortal wounds while also not losing his identity from being in his Ghost Rider form for too long. Not to mention enduring these hours of daily torture, which at this point for Robbie, it's been over a week. But the next day while he's being tortured by the Black Skull, Robbie ends up giving him that scream that he's been asking for. But with doing so, like the Black Skull had mentioned, this didn't get Robbie too far. Because eventually a ton of war machines showed up, Robbie ended up toasting them and just getting thrown back in his cell, only to then get back to the torture the next day. But this particular day, the Black Skull had noticed that this Ghost Rider was being extremely quiet, as if he was focusing on something. And for the Black Skull, this piqued his interest because he wanted to know what's going on in this Ghost Rider's head in hopes that he would share it from one skull to another. But quickly we come to find that the reason why Robbie was concentrating, it was because he was driving. And right then his charger just breaks free from the chains in the lower dungeon, driving up the walls and nearly making its way to Robbie. But this plan then gets canned when the Ghost Goblin shows up, who's your alternate universe Green Goblin Ghost Rider, and he just helps the Black Skull get things back under control. But it's here with the Black Skull and the Ghost Goblin have a conversation where they mention that they've never seen a rider like this before. And Ghost Goblin mentions that he's seen plenty on motorbikes, some on horses, and even one on a shark at one point. But the thing that has the Ghost Goblin the most curious about Robbie is that he doesn't smell the stench of Mephisto on him. Which for Robbie, this is one of those things that goes back to how he became a Ghost Rider in the first place. Because aside from us seeing Robbie possess a dead celestial, one of the things that's arguably more unique about him is his origin and his unique connection to the spirit of vengeance, which he has by way of his estranged uncle, serial killer Eli Morrow, rather than it being a deal with Mephisto, which in that case would have given him the power from Zarathos, which makes him super unique without being tied to someone super powerful like Zarathos, like Johnny Blaze or Alejandro Jones. And he's still different from Danny Ketch, who got his abilities from the powerful Noble Kale. And I mean, this difference for Robbie, it may be something important down the line that connects to him being the multiversal Ghost Rider since the Masters of Evil are in cahoots with Mephisto. But only time will tell. But also, while Robbie's here, he hears the Ghost Goblin's bag of skull bombs, which were made from skulls of Ghost Riders from across the multiverse, calling him the All Rider, while also saying, All hail the All Rider. But it's next when we then see Robbie taken back to his cell with the Deathlock, where we find that the Deathlock has been helping him out by reminding him that he's Robbie Reyes and telling him about his human self, while also reminding Robbie about his little brother Gabe back home who Robbie loves more than anything. And with the Deathlock doing this for Robbie, little does he know that these roaches are getting the word back to the Black Skull. So after this, when we then go back to your next day of regular scheduled torture, which seems like it just goes on and on, it's here where we find that Robbie has been instructed to make his way to a specific room 
which has a lot of screaming behind the door. But when he makes his way inside, he finds a countless number of alternate universe versions of himself who have pretty much turned on each other after months of near starvation and torture. And as Robbie makes his way through this room, with his prosthetic chain foot of vengeance, his multiversal counterparts pause for a moment, but then they just go back to killing each other the Black Skull told him that all they have to do to go home is be their last Robbie standing. And through the course of this, the Black Skull is just taunting Robbie, telling him how in every other universe he's visited, the Robbie Reyes on each Earth, they would either be tragically insignificant or just right out non-existent. And for Robbie, this whole experience is terrifying, with him hearing his own voice scream in pain while being murdered by himself in every corner of this room. And the fear just causes him to freeze for a moment. But then with him thinking of how he can stop all these versions of himself without hurting them, and he looks in their eyes and he sees his own fear, along with a desperation and madness that he had never seen before. And Robbie tells himself that under no circumstances, regardless of what the Black Skull has said, he's never going to allow himself to do these things, not even to himself. But as he tries to keep telling himself that over and over in his own head, trying to drown out all of their screams, and it isn't long before Robbie realizes that now he's the only person screaming. Which from here, Robbie admits that he's broken. He's finally past that point, though he hasn't specifically said those words, out loud at least. Because it's here when he's thrown back in his cell with a Deathlock, and the Deathlock just looks at him and says that the Black Skull finally did it. He finally broke you. But for Robbie, he just thinks to himself like, no, I did it to myself. But it's here with the Deathlock just doing what he can to help Robbie hold on, since Robbie Reyes is the All Rider, and at this point, he's the only Avenger that this world really has, as far as they know. But then more of these bugs make their way into the room, and as the Deathlock tries to smash them, amongst these bugs, a voice says, hey, watch it, pal. And it's here where they find that Tony Stark, the Ant-Man of Earth 818, has made his way here to rescue the two of them, only for Robbie to then respond that he does not want to be rescued. Alright, so at this point when we jump back in, Earth 818 Tony Stark has made his way into the Black Skull's fortress to save this mysterious Ghost Rider he had seen from afar, only to find out that that Ghost Rider, Robbie Reyes, doesn't want to be saved, which at this point throws a monkey wrench in his whole entire plan because Tony and his entire team unanimously agreed on coming together to get the Ghost Rider out of there, with Vision saying that it's only logical that they do something, while their Moon Knight, Mariama Specter, didn't see the idea so much as logical, but even still she expressed that she had a gut feeling that they should save him. And as for their Wonder Man, who still managed to be a movie star in this world, go figure, but he also agreed, even though it's only because he just wants a piece of the gory action. And as for Ben Grimm, the Infinity thing, He's a man of few words, with this whole ordeal and the connection to Infinity's End, but nonetheless with him saying the door's opening, it is time, he also agrees that saving the Ghost Rider is what they all need to come together and do. But at this time, with Tony making his way in, and the rest of the team waiting outside for his word, Robbie just tells Tony that he's not leaving because his work isn't finished. In the Deathlock, he also co-signs with Robbie, telling Tony that the Ghost Rider's not running from his destiny. And I mean, of course, for Tony, none of this is making sense, because it really just sounds like Robbie's just waiting to get his other foot cut off, talking about he ain't done here. But with the way that this is done, the Deathlock tells Tony that they're staying because this is who they are, which then causes him to ask Tony who he is, whether it's Ant or Avenger. And right away, when Tony hears the word Avenger, he's like, nah, that's not his thing. That's not what his team agreed to, because they're really just trying to do the Ghost Rider a solid with getting the Ghost Rider out of here so he can do the Avenging. But then it's here where Moon Knight radios out to Tony, so now he's filling her in on the whole Ghost Rider don't want to be saved update. And Tony also lets her know, like, it freaks him out a bit that the two of these guys just trusted him when he showed up, with him only saying at the time, hi, I'm Tony Stark. And I mean, it makes sense since Tony doesn't really know where exactly Robbie came from and why he's here. But then while Tony's on the comms with Moon Knight, he asks Robbie to go ahead and just break down his plan since he doesn't want to be saved, so Tony can go ahead and fill in the others. And Tony tells Robbie to be quick about it, because at any moment, and as soon as Tony says that, symbiote material starts coming down from the ceiling. Because now the Black Skull knows what's going on, and he ain't having it. And when this happens, just outside, Mariyama and the others hear the screaming over the comms as they see a ton of war machines take to the sky. And this all lets them know that Tony needs saving as well. But at this point, with Tony's team realizing that he's been compromised on the inside, they know they gotta get in there and help him out, but there's just one small problem. And that small problem happens to be that Tony had shrunk down his team in order to get them this close, and the Stark particles aren't gonna wear off for about a half hour. 
but even with this being the case, Wonder Man tells the others to go ahead and go inside, get Stark and the Ghost Rider, and he'll take care of the war machines. But initially when he says this, Moon Knight tells him that he should probably wait till he's up to his regular size. But instead, Wonder Man goes in anyway, and he takes down a ton of these war machines just fine. And it's from here where the rest of the team splits up, with Moon Knight and Vision going inside, while Infinity Thing stays outside and helps with the war machines. But while we're on the topic of Infinity Thing, the Ben Grimm of Earth 818, on one hand you might think, well he's Infinity Thing, why doesn't he just end all of this? And I mean if that crossed your mind, I don't blame you, cause that was my first impression as well. But then with the way that Earth 818 Ben Grimm's origin is explained, with him becoming an astronaut and searching into the stars for something to save his world, which is what led him into the incident that turned him into the infinity thing. But with this happening and him coming back without the personality of your conventional Ben Grimm, it almost seems as if his abundance of knowledge, which reaches through time and space and all the way to infinity's end, it's more or less giving him a godlike mindset, where he's looking at the larger scope and doing what he believes to be necessary in the now but ultimately to protect the Avengers Tower at Infinity's End. So in the meantime in between time he's really just doing what he believes needs to be done. But just after this we go back inside with Robbie and the others where we find the Black Skull letting Robbie know that he was smart for not trying to escape because after all this world now belongs to the Black Skull. So if Robbie did run there's nowhere on this planet that he could actually go to to really get away. Which makes sense because I mean it's, it's true. But also with the Black Skull crashing into this cell with the three of these guys here, this happens to give Tony a bit of PTSD. And for him, as a knee-jerk response, he shrinks smaller and smaller until he's floating between atoms, which unfortunately takes him out of communication with Moon Knight and the others, but this causes her and Vision to do a bit of snooping around the place, with the two of them still shrunken down, which is really only helpful to Moon Knight, with it allowing her to squeeze through smaller places, while on the other hand, Vision, he can just go through walls. But eventually this takes them to a room where they find that the Black Skull has multiple doorways that the Black Skull has created that are accessing a rupture in the membrane of reality. And at a first look, Moon Knight, she's not really sure what this means, but her first guess is that they probably gotta blow it up. And it's right then where the Stark particles wear off, with them being in a room full of war machines, which gives them no other choice but to engage. But then it's also here where we jump back over to Robbie's cell, where we find that the Black Skull has not only just gone back into interrogation mode, but he's also gone overboard to the point where he has to scale himself back a little bit. And with him doing this, he finally asks Robbie Reyes the burning question that he really wants to know. And that question just happens to be, who is the Avenger Prime? And for anyone who's kind of new to the story, that's a question that goes back to our talks on Avengers, the Death Hunters, and really all the way back to Free Comic Book Day in 2021. And as we continue our talks, we'll make our way back to that, because as of now it has been revealed, so careful for spoilers in the comments, but we'll make our way to that conversation in the coming weeks. But it's as soon as the Black Skull asks Robbie Reyes this question, when Tony Stark comes back, giving the Black Skull the biggest punch in the history of this planet, which again is Earth 818, cause on Earth 616 there's been some big punches out there. But nonetheless, with Tony going this big, he can't hold it for long, like he's about to pass out. So for that reason, he tells the writer, you know, like whatever you're gonna do, do it now, do it quick. But then without warning, the Black Skull breaks free from Tony's hand, while also sending multiple spikes all over the place. But also when this happens, we come to find out that in the last issue, when the Deathlock was trying to help Robbie out, in between Robbie's torture sessions, after Robbie's last session, when the Deathlock had thought that the Black Skull had broken Robbie, this caused the Deathlock to remotely wire himself to Robbie's nervous system, which from that moment forward caused the Deathlock to feel the agony that the Black Skull was dishing out, so that Robbie could have his mind completely completely clear to focus on vengeance. And it's here where Robbie tells the Black Skull a bit of information that he didn't know about his own symbiote. Because the Black Skull believes that his symbiote is like a weapon or a sword that he can just wield however he wishes. But truth be told, the symbiote's more like a passenger that uses the Red Skull as a vehicle. And it's here where Robbie tells him that he is the All Rider, which means that he can drive anything. And with saying this, it's here where Robbie calls for his car and he chains the Black Skull to the back of it, causing the sweet smell of hope, which is actually the Black Skull skin being dragged off his body. But with Robbie driving out with a regular sized Tony Stark riding shotgun, we then see Wonder Man and Infinity Thing who had returned back to their regular size around the same time as Moon Knight and Vision. But at this point, they're still outside wrecking these war machines like it's nothing. But then also, as Tony and Robbie make their way out from the fortress, Moon Knight reaches out to Tony on the comms, 
and she more or less overhears him talking about he's about to throw up. But also when he's done, he wants to drive Ghost Rider's charger. But when hearing this, Moon Knight cuts in and she tells Tony that it ain't over. Because back inside with her and Vision, these six stores accessing different universes begin to go active. But before Mariyama can get Vision to close the doors and shut this thing down, each of these doors let in a red skull from an alternate universe. And the first one who enters says, are these the ones who caused you to fall, brother? We shall have red revenge in your name. For if one skull falls, a thousand more shall take its place. So now with these guys getting here, they're in a race to take down whoever defeated the Black Skull. Because by order of the Masters of Evil, whichever one of these guys is first to defeat the Usurper, I used air quotes, <laughs> that variant will then inherit this world. So now on Earth 818, there's a race for the new Waste Lord. All right, so with how this begins, we do a bit of a pivot from what we've seen going on so far in the story, because it's here where we head to Midgard at the end of time, in an era that some of you guys may remember right off the bat. But for those who don't, I'll take a moment to fill you in. Because this world that had been established for eons into the future, we were first introduced to it in Jason Aaron's God of Thunder when we visited past, present, and future Thor. But at that time in issue 23, we went eons into the future and we saw an insane battle between King Thor and Galactus, which led King Thor to seek desperate measures, such as retrieving the Necrosword to defeat Galactus and save Midgard. Even though at this point, humanity has been gone since Loki annihilated it years ago. But for King Thor, after he defeated old Galactus, he had then bled to the earth, and when his blood touched the ground, his god blood restored the land, which of course was a byproduct of his mother being Gaia, the elder god, mother of earth, mother of nature. But this had eventually then later led to the rebirth of the human race, and Midgard starting over pretty much, under the name of New Midgard. But of course, this happy ending wasn't long lived, with King Thor having to leave New Midgard, because at this point, things just started popping off left and right, like with him fighting Wolverine, who also had the Phoenix Force, and I got the link below for anyone who's new who may have missed our talk on that, because eventually Thor's granddaughters, the Goddesses of Thunder, faced an invasion that involved Fing Fang Foom along with a ton of monsters that was being led by the ghost ridingest, iron fistedness, star brand, master of the mysticness, Doctor Doom you've ever seen. Only for all of this then to be followed by the return of Gore the God Butcher, who eventually became the thing he hated the most. But I say all of this to just quickly paint the picture of this distant future, because this is also the last place that we had seen King Thor, with him sharing his final words with Mjolnir, as well as sharing with his granddaughters his last will and testament, with him leaving Mjolnir and New Midgard to them. And at the time this ended with King Thor heading off into the void for the rest of time to single-handedly hold back the entropy that was destroying the universe, which really gave us this sacrificial ending of Thor holding up the pillars of creation for all eternity. And now in Avengers Forever, Jason Aaron has brought us back to this distant future at the end of time, a new Midgard which is being watched over by Thor's granddaughters, Elsif, Frigg, and Atli, who've come together to interpret this thunder that has come to new Midgard, which usually for this world would be a sign of hope, but this time the three of them interpret it differently, with Frigg hearing it as fear, Elsif hearing it as a cry of pain, and Atli hearing it as a call to war. And with how this is happening, they see this as a calling from their grandfather, King Thor. But at the same time, they're not sure if this is like the moment when one of them should lift the hammer as it starts levitating. But then at a moment's notice, it starts raining Phoenix fire and brimstone, which then lets them know with it being too lethal to just be a message from their grandfather, this chaotic combination gives them a sign that something else is going on. And there has to be more to it, because amongst it raining phoenix fire from the sky, down also comes the yet living severed hand of old man phoenix wolverine, who they immediately recognize. But with seeing all this randomness, Frigg and Atlib turn to Elsif, who's the smartest of the three, to get her opinion on what all of this means. And Elsif tells them that this has to be something grave if it can tear the longest living phoenix into shreds. And this has to be something from beyond even their universe. So it's here where the three of them take Mjolnir and tie it to their ship in hopes of Mjolnir showing them the way to what's causing this multiversal chaos. But then immediately, we jump back over to Earth 818, right where we left off just after the Black Skull's defeat, which had triggered a failsafe for multiple Red Skull variants to make their way to Earth 818 with the hopes of taking the Black Skull's throne by quickly defeating the person who defeated him with that being the rule that was set in place by the Masters of Evil. But now with us continuing back to the main story, it's here where the Goddesses of Thunder also find themselves arriving here on Earth 818, with Mjolnir leading them exactly to where they needed to go. And with them crashing the party, they're able to recognize rather quickly 
who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Especially with them seeing symbiotes on the side of the Red Skull, which quickly reminded them of Gore's Necro Sword. So without hesitation, they joined the fight, helping Tony Stark and the other heroes. But even still, the fight isn't even needed for long, because before you know it, Robbie Reyes, the All Rider, with his brand new overpowered abilities, uses the symbiote against them and sends all of these Red Skulls back to their worlds, which was a pretty quick and easy fix. But now with this happening, they declare that Earth-818 will never have another Waste Lord after the Black Skull, to where in his case, Robbie has separated him from a symbiote with locking the symbiote in his trunk and then sentencing the Black Skull to forever penance. But even with the Black Skull being taken care of, the the rest of the world still has all of the war machines to deal with. So from here, Robbie and Wonder Man, they make their rounds and over the course of one night, they take out the rest of the war machines to make sure that this world is truly free. But then the next morning when this is done, the Wonder Man of Earth 818 approaches Thor's granddaughters, first asking which of them is a god. And he does this because he wants to know if the gods from their world answer prayers, which right there in itself is a bit of Jason Aaron calling back to himself with a theme that was very heavy in God of Thunder, with Thor answering the prayers of the people of Indigar, as well as his numerous encounters with gore throughout his lifetime that eventually made Thor a better god. But Frigg quickly responds, telling him that her and her sisters are all gods, which then leads Wonder Man to make his prayer known, which is something he'd never done before, you know, given the state of this world where prayers are never answered. But from here, Elsa tells him to go ahead, and Wonder Man prays that he'll never have to kill anyone again, which right away had Atlee like, you know, that's a dumb prayer, which of course is because she's the one that loves to fight. But Elsa at least lets Wonder Man know that his prayer has been heard, as Frigg goes on to tell him that as the daughters of Asgard, they'll do their best to make it so. But also as a quick reminder, before this Wonder Man joined Tony Stark and the others, he had been killing as a form of entertainment in this twisted world, with him being a movie star amongst the Wastelanders, in films where people actually died as a form of entertainment. So yeah, it makes sense given the opportunity that he would pray the type of prayer that he did. But with the Goddesses of Thunder knowing that there's more to be done, they make their way to Earth 818 Ant-Man for answers, and it's here where they come to the conclusion that the hammer that he'd found, that was left by the 818 Odin of the Avengers 1 million BC, had called out to their Mjolnir, and this is what led the Goddesses of Thunder here. But also it's here that we find that on Earth 818, there have been a similar moment of it raining Phoenix Fire and Brimstone, which had then caused the other hand of Old Man Phoenix Wolverine to arrive here, with this other hand still being alive, much like the hand that Thor's granddaughters found on New Midgard. And this lets the goddesses of thunder know that the body of the old man Phoenix has been scattered across the multiverse. And for that reason, their objective has been updated to reassemble old man Phoenix as they continue to go forward and do what they can to save the multiverse. But also before they leave Tony Stark Ant-Man, Robbie Reyes helps repair their ship so they can go on their way. But also before they go, the goddesses of thunder leave seeds that they have brought from New Midgard, which were seeds from the lost gardens of Asgard and they leave them behind on Earth 818 to help the scorched wasteland grow and flourish as a way of leaving this world with hope and possibly even become the paradise that Earth 818 Odin wanted it to be back when he adopted this world as his own. And I mean, it's a pretty way for it to come full circle, but it works. But with the Goddesses of Thunder leaving, the Deathlock lets Tony Stark know that him and Robbie gotta get going too. But also now with Moon Knight and Vision missing, since the fight with all the Red Skulls from across the multiverse, Tony lets the Deathlock know that he's gonna go with them, even if there's the slightest chance of him finding the two of them. But before Tony leaves with Robbie and the Deathlock, he tells Infinity Thing to work with Wonder Man on rebuilding this world while they're gone, since saving Earth 818 is pretty much a done deal. But after seeing this, we then head over to the center of Infinity, where we find that it's here where both Moon Knight and Vision had been taken to during that chaotic battle with all the Red Skulls across the multiverse. But while they're here discussing how they're gonna find their way home, they hear a voice behind them saying that they won't be going home anytime soon, not until the war is won, even if it takes forever. And with hearing this, they turn around and see Captain Carter, War Widow, as well as Longbow, standing in front of the Avengers Tower. And I mean, with seeing this, like, I wouldn't have minded if War Widow had instead went by Iron Widow, but I get it, she's more like War Machine, so there's that. But in the case of Clint Barton going by Longbow, I feel like there was a missed opportunity to just call him Purple Arrow, because he looks like he's gonna turn around and say, you felt this city. All right, so with how this begins, we start off with the doom above all, 
who at this point is in an undisclosed location. And when we find him here removing his mask, he's speaking to someone off panel who we'll see in a little bit. But while he has this guest here, he gives a series of specific instructions, of which he's given to countless other guests the exact same way, time and time again, with him telling them to look him in the face for the full duration without looking away, unless they want their eyes removed. He tells them not to beg for the mercy of murder, and he lets them know that they don't have the permission to go mad, at least not until he gives the order. But before we see how this specific one-on-one -on -one plays out, we take a step back to a time not too long before this moment, when the Masters of Evil made their way to Earth-91, which in this universe is the planet of the Man-Things. But it's here where the Masters of Evil had made their way to kill this world's Avengers 1 million BC, and it's kind of funny how when they get there, the man things say that the masters of evil are the weird looking ones, which I mean makes sense because most people in this universe look like the man thing. But I mean as soon as we hop in here, the masters of evil, they make quick work of these guys, every last one of them. Because back when the masters of evil were making their rounds across the multiverse, this attack is just one of the many slaughters that they had served to countless teams of prehistoric avengers, who time after time just couldn't withstand the amount of power that these guys were sending their way. And arguably one of the biggest advantages that they have on their side is the element of surprise. But also with the seeing the multiversal masters of evil quickly conquer earth 91, this time with us looking back, we get to see one of the main issues that they come across, which as the Doom above all would describe, is the bickering. Because anytime they conquer a new Earth, the rest of his team is just arguing back and forth about who gets this one. But with the majority of the team arguing and bickering time and time again about who would get what Earth, it was also here on Earth 91 when some of the guys got a bit curious about the Doom above all, since he didn't really care to make his claim on any of the worlds. And it even came to the point to where the Ghost Goblin believed that the Doom above all was playing some sort of game or he just thought that he was better than all of them. But really this behavior goes right along with what we've seen from the Doom above all so far, with him showing no interest in trying to personally reset any world's timeline. And really for the most part, this whole time the reason why has been a mystery, at least up until now. Because it's here where we then go back to that undisclosed location and it's here where we find who the Doom above all has been talking to. And as it turns out, he's talking to the Doom, or better yet, Doom Thing of Earth-91, who he had pulled out of that world's modern timeline just before going back to that world's 1 million BC with the Masters of Evil and resetting their timeline. But it's here where we get to learn a lot about the Doom above all as he takes the Doom Thing from Earth-91 and makes him undergo a process, if you will, that the doom above all would describe as revealing himself to his subject one scar at a time so that they would know who he is to the fullest and choose to serve him or otherwise go mad and just beg for death. And it really depends on the individual as far as which one they'll choose because the results between the two vary and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But through the course of this, with the Doom above all giving the Doom thing the instruction that if he looks away, then he'll have his eyes removed. Well, he looked away, so the Doom above all calls for his guards, and as they walk in, the Doom above all goes on to mention how a number of their variants across the multiverse have also hidden their faces for numerous reasons, whether their appearance was grotesque, or even if it was something as vain as a nick from a razor. But he goes on to tell them that there's an infinite range of reasoning for why their variants wear masks, from across the multiverse. But then finally, when he asks the Doom Thing what he's hiding behind his mask, the Doom Thing then responds that it's fire. Because for whatever knows insolence, burns at the touch of the Doom Thing. And when the Doom Thing says this, he breaks out of his restraints and he goes for the guards, telling the Doom above all that he doesn't deserve such a name for hiding behind Doom bots. Because just about every version of Doom has Doom bots. And for that reason, he believes that the Doom above all has to be average at best. But when the Doom Thing grabs one of these guys and they melt in his hand, it's here where he realizes that all these other Dooms are variants. And each and every one of them were put on the same cross or one very similar because there were instances where he had to accommodate for height. But all these variants of Doom were given the same instructions for them to see the Doom above all in the fullness and truth of who he is. But from here, all the variants are ordered to nail the Doom thing's head to the cross as well as remove his eyelids so that the Doom above all can continue. And it's from here where he goes on to show the Doom thing, how he's executed this same process on countless other worlds. But again, for the Doom above all, resetting the timelines on these worlds means nothing to him because he sees these other Earths as nothing more than an incubator for another Doom. But now with the Doom thing seeing more about the Doom above all, 
It's here where he takes it a step further and he shows the Doom thing, why exactly he's collecting all of these variants. But in order to explain this properly, Doom Supreme goes back to the beginning and he tells Doom Thing about Valeria, his one true love who he had sacrificed when he stripped the living flesh from her bones and forged it into an armor that was fueled by the power of that sacrifice. And this is something where Jason and Aaron had taken inspiration from Mark Wade's 2003 issue of Fantastic Four, Volume 3, Issue 67, when at the time, the Doom of Earth 616 believed that when he was young, he made a fatal choice in choosing science over sorcery. But he found the opportunity to choose again when he made a pact with a cabal of nether demons who claimed that they could make him the sorcerer that he could have been, and greater. But in order to do so, he had to give up something of indescribable value something irreplaceable and like we'd seen at the time he had given up the love of his life valeria and with the way that this is done with jason aaron this time the doom above all picks up from this moment to where from here he goes on to become sorcerer supreme and conquer his universe while also torturing those who did him wrong and of course quote unquote those who did him wrong for the most part being reed richards who really in reed's case depending on the day I kind of see him as the villain too. But for Doom Supreme, he spent years torturing Reed amongst others. And even with this being his most satisfying moment, after years, he admits that it got boring. But then he realized that it wasn't enough to just make his enemy suffer. And that's when he decided that he needed to take it a step further by killing the prehistoric Avengers of his world so that his enemies would never exist. But for Doom Supreme, after years of mystical labor, he had exhausted the enchantments of his armor. And for him to continue, he would need to renew that power with another sacrifice. But at this point, he had nothing left to offer. There was no one else in existence who he loved, except for himself. And because Doom loved himself so much, killing his own variants worked as a suitable sacrifice. And really with him figuring out that this was doable with the first one, it caused him to have both a deeper love and hatred for himself. To where in the beginning, he was doing this with tears in his eyes, like super emotional. But also with him knowing that there's a multiverse of dooms that he can sacrifice one after the other. This had all eventually came together when he joined up with Mephisto, who gave Doom Supreme the idea of putting together the Masters of Evil and going on their multiversal slaughter, which for Doom Supreme was an easy yes because for him, this speeds up the whole process. But from here, with the Doom above all, revealing so much of himself to the Man-Thing, this caused the Man-Thing to beg him to stop because he couldn't bear to see anymore. And now with the Man-Thing swearing his allegiance to the Doom above all, he orders for the Doom Thing to be let down from the cross to where then he tells him to cut out his own tongue. And now, as an obedient follower, he does exactly that. But as Doom Supreme leaves the room, it's here where we kind of get a look at the few Dooms who joined him versus the many others who just begged for death. But for the Doom above all, he sees all of this as necessary for what's to come with this being the salvation of all Dooms. But then after this, we take a step further as this undisclosed location gets disclosed. And we come to find out that the Doom above all's base of operations is on Doom the living planet and i'm pretty sure it's the one from earth 14412 and not the one from temporary reality number 157 because <laughs> him dead but yeah this doom was also visited by the doom above all he looked upon his face and i mean i doubt he had to get up on a cross and all that but doom the living planet also agrees that doom supreme is the only doom that can break other dooms and he too has said all hell the doom above all the doom of dooms all right, so one of the things that we've seen so far in this series is the multiversal masters of evil making their rounds to different Earths with each member making their claim and choosing an Earth for themselves. And so far, not only have we seen this as a team effort, but we've also seen how this looks when particular members of the masters of evil claim a world for themselves like the Black Skull on Earth 818 after changing the future of that world by way of getting rid of the prehistoric Avengers. But aside from that, we've also seen members of the multiversal masters of evil execute their own agendas, much like what we were shown when we talked about the origin of the Doom Above All, with him assembling and joining this team only for the purpose of continuing to do what he was already doing before them. But at this point now, when we go over to King Killmonger, it's here where we get a look into his personal agenda 
as far as traveling the multiverse with one specific target in mind. But in this case, unlike the Doom above all who is seeking all of his own variants, King Killmonger has been scouring the multiverse on a mission to kill every variant of T'Challa, with no discretion to the age of T'Challa on any of these Earths. But this time around, with us seeing King Killmonger carry out this extravagant side mission, it's here in his case where we find that his actions have actually birthed a new hero. Cause on this earth, we're told that King T'Chaka had been warned by the ancestors about the coming of King Killmonger. And with him knowing this, he had made preparations to send his son T'Challa away from their earth in order to keep him safe. And with seeing this, you can tell that Jason Aaron, he's not even trying to hide the whole Superman parallel here. Because it's very clear as this world is being destroyed by King Killmonger, starting with Wakanda, that this T'Challa is very much being set on the path of Superman. And I mean, I'm cool with that, because Jason Aaron, he's gonna do what he wants to do. But I will say one thing, if they ever take this idea over to the What If show, I'm gonna need them to do a Wakandan version of the Smallville intro, because it only makes sense. But as we see baby T'Challa take off from his home planet, as it's destroyed, it's here where Jason Aaron takes us forward a number of years later, and with doing so, he takes a bit of a sidestep from the Superman-esque type of story, for the moment at least. Cause it's here where we find that young T'Challa is living in the sky slums of Chandelar, under the alias of the Sky Spider, with him donning a vibranium suit that he made out of the pieces of the rocket that brought him here. Which in this case, you can tell Jason Aaron was taking it from Superman to Spider-Man, but he still wanted to keep it a bit Superman at the same time. But trust me, it does not stop here. But nonetheless, T'Challa had been waiting some time for the War Panthers of King Killmonger to make their way to Shi'ar space, so that they can ultimately lead him to King Killmonger. But with the Sky Spider running into these War Panthers, and I know, it's ridiculous, but in this mix up, he does not get them to tell him where King Killmonger is. But what he does notice while he's fighting them is that his ancestors begin to weep. And the reason why is because they believe that he's about to join them. Because his mix up with the War Panthers has actually gotten the attention of King Killmonger. And when he shows up, he doesn't bother to get out of his ship to confront T'Challa. But instead, King Killmonger just hits the entire area with an open face orbital cannon, which are compliments of his modified Asgardian destroyer armor. But with King Killmonger blasting the sky slums of Chandelar, on his end he believes that he's killed T'Challa, but just after this we jump forward many tomorrows later. And we're not really told how many, but apparently it was enough tomorrows for T'Challa to switch up his look. But it's here where we find that not only is T'Challa still alive, but he's also upgraded his suit to where now, rather than him being a Spider-Man like character, this new suit is more of an Iron Man type approach. With T'Challa making the suit out of vibranium which he's taken from war dogs across the Shi'ar system in order to build it, so rather than him being Iron Man, in this case he's Vibranium Man. But for T'Challa, one of the things that we notice through the course of this is that he has an obsession with facing King Killmonger. And this is a fight that T'Challa has been looking forward to his whole life. So of course, with King Killmonger hitting him with the range attack last time and then dipping out, T'Challa wasn't too happy about it. But now with this upgraded suit, T'Challa hopes that he can take the fight to King Killmonger for a bout that is much more up close and personal. But for the time being, with T'Challa lacking the resources, he's really able to only go after King Killmonger by jumping from one ship to the next in the wake of King Killmonger's rampage within the Shi'ar system. And it's here with him doing this where we see him build up his suit more and more as he gets closer to King Killmonger. But also along the way, T'Challa is constantly reminded of the death caused by King Killmonger as he sees the Shi'ar casualties along the way. And for the weeks to come that it's going to take him to get to the main ship, from time to time, T'Challa will take rest with the dead before he moves forward. But eventually we find that T'Challa's made his way to one of the War Panther ships that's quickly running out of oxygen. And it's here where one of the War Panthers is just begging T'Challa to take the vibranium, take whatever he wants, but he begs T'Challa not to leave him here to die. And it's here where we get to know a bit more about this T'Challa's character. Because with this War Panther begging T'Challa not to let him die here in this wrecked ship that is quickly running out of oxygen, it's here where T'Challa's like, okay, I won't let you die here. So instead T'Challa just pulls this guy out into space where there is no oxygen. And the poor fella dies there. And I mean, I guess he should have been more specific with that request. But after weeks of jumping from one wrecked ship to the other, T'Challa eventually makes his way to King Killmonger's ship. And just before he enters the ship, he uses his Dora Milaje AI program, which is in the suit, to first scan the ship to make sure that King Killmonger's there, to where then he runs a final diagnostic to make sure that his suit's ready. Cause I mean, you don't just wanna jump in there on a low battery. But it's here where T'Challa breaks into King Killmonger's ship 
where we get our first look at the completed Vibranium Man suit. And as soon as he gets there, it's on sight. But for King Killmonger, initially, instead of clapping back with his modified destroyer armor, he immediately claps back with the jokes. And I mean, it starts off with the suit, with him saying that it looks like it was made in the junkyard, only for T'Challa then to respond that he made this in a grave. But you can tell with how it was done, like it was, feels like it was a bit of a setup for it to be like Prince T'Challa built this suit in a grave with a bunch of scraps. And with how it was done, it didn't quite stick the landing, but even still, like you can see the loose reference. But through the course of this fight, King Killmonger is making fun of T'Challa, not only for his suit, but also for going through so many identity changes. One minute he's Spider-Man, next minute he's Iron Man. And King Killmonger even goes as far as to tell T'Challa that he's not even a good version of any of these. To where from there, he goes on to tell T'Challa that the suit that he has is built off of the scraps of King Killmonger's table. Which really is just a way of him implying that there's no way that T'Challa's suit can hold up to Killmonger's modified destroyer armor. And I mean, with King Killmonger saying this, he's not wrong. But T'Challa does make sure to tell him that his suit flows with the blood and spirit of all of Wakanda and it will not fall. Wakanda forever. But then again, T'Challa's not doing too well in this fight because suit to suit, King Killmonger has him beat. And for T'Challa, in spite of all that he's doing here, he can barely hang. And with King Killmonger knowing that he's about to end this, he tells T'Challa to do him a favor. And he says, make sure on the next earth that I go to that you're a bit more original. <laughs> And just after saying that, he then tosses T'Challa out of the ship and into a nearby star while saying Wakanda nevermore. And it's kind of like, man, you gonna say that just after he said Wakanda forever? He on demon time. But just after this, three days later, we find that Robbie Reyes has made his way here with the Tony Stark of Earth-818, as well as the Deathlock from Infinity's End. But they've made their way here because Earth-818 Tony Stark has told him that he has a lock on the location of the surviving T'Challa of this universe. And with them saying this, of course, Deathlock, he's a bit skeptical because the only thing at this location is a star. But then Robbie's like, that's no problem. I can drive through stars. And so it's here where they drive through this star and they drag out this vibranium cocoon where we come to find out that this whole time with us seeing the T'Challa from this universe go through all of these changes that they were really just the steps necessary in order to transform him into who he truly is which as it turns out is the Star Panther the last son of Wakanda and the man who will kill King Killmonger all right so for this one we start off with day one in what would appear to be a type of prison with a variant of Steve Rogers who's not really sure how he got here. And really with the way that this is set up, it's more of a squid game type of situation or closer to something of that nature than it would be to an actual prison. But as soon as he wakes up, he walks out of his room to where then we see that there are a number of rooms here, but they're all open. None of them have doors. So as Steve walks out, he's like, hello, is anyone here? My name is Steve. And right away, the guy in the next room's like, you know, that's funny. My name is Steve too. And the funny thing is between the two of them, they really just think that they just happen to have the same name. So without them really noticing that they're variants of one another, they naturally try to figure out where they are and how did they get there without so much as picking up on the first hint. But then it's here as this squid game. I mean, this story continues. It's here where the doors that lead into the population area swing open. But as they do, it's very dark on the other side. No one's coming in. And Steve number one is like, hello, like, is anyone there? But then right away, Steve number three comes running out of his room and he goes racing straight through that open door screaming death to the warmongers but at this point with the florida man looking steve racing out steve number three and i mean he's not really a florida man he's from california but we'll talk more about him in a little bit but with him racing through this opening door steve number two he starts to get scared and we come to find out that prior to this he was in a quote-unquote nervous hospital so for steve number two with him being here it reminds him a lot of how it was for him back home but just after this steve one and two hear a dog bark and aside from the both of them this is the third steve that they're aware of and really it's here where it starts to get very uncanny for them because now they got a dog named steve but then from here only moments later they hear an excruciating scream outside of the door which is then shortly after followed by the sound of a taser and steve number three getting thrown right back in but then it's here where we get a comment from steve number five you know with number four being the dog and five says that three is not dead he's just stupid but the next when the door shuts, Steve number five tells Steve number one to ask number three what he saw. And it's here where number three just goes on to tell them that he saw obstacles. He climbed over a few, lights were flashing, then somebody hit him who he never saw coming. 
But then just after this, we then go over to day two, where the entrance door opens again, and Steve number three just goes running out full speed, only for him to be stopped yet once again and knocked all the way back into the room. And I can't say what or who exactly it was, but we'll get to that in a little bit. But on day two, with Steve number three getting knocked back inside once again, it's here where he more or less just lays there and he tells the other Steves that they're all cowards. But with number three saying this, number five, the one who hasn't so much as stepped out of his room, tells him that that's not the case, but instead some of us are something much worse. To where then the next day, Steve number three yells out, my name is Steve Rogers and I'm a political prisoner because I refuse to take part in your illegal war. You fascists will not break me. To where then the door opens and he goes for it again. But at this point, Steve number one, he's just like, none of this makes sense. This is weird. All of us are named Steve Rogers. But then Steve number two tells him that he had a conversation with the dog, Steve number four. And he told Steve number two that none of them are in their right universe, which right there gets them closer to figuring out what exactly is going on here. But then next, Steve number one asked number two, what was the last thing that he remembered before he woke up here? And for him, it was a usual night crying under his covers. And he knew that somebody was in his room, but even still he couldn't see them. And the next thing he knew, he was here. And for Steve number one, as it turns out, he's a comic book artist. He was drawing pages for tales of suspense, but then he heard a car pull up outside, which was rather strange for him because he lives on the 34th floor. But then from here, day after day, after day, after day, Steve number three makes multiple attempts and he keeps coming back every time. And over the course of these days, he tells the others that there's only one man standing between them and their way out of here. But then on day seven, Steve number one asks number three, what did he see this time? And number three tells him that if he wants to know, he needs to get out there and find out for himself. But after this, when we then go over to day 11, <laughs> Steve doggy dogs all upset. He's telling number three not to go because he's going to get killed. But three goes anyway, because he'd rather die out there than be stuck in here. But this time when three goes, one goes with him. Because after all, it's only one guy that they're up against, right? These two can take him, right? Wrong, <laughs> because both of these guys get tased and thrown back in together. And number three is telling number one, like, hey, it was just like I told you, wasn't it? It was fast, you couldn't even see it coming. And one lets him know that it was fast, but he did see something. And with saying this, Steve number one draws it on the wall to where then the next day and the day after, he tries again, he sees a little more and he adds the details. But then on day 14, Steve number four joins the group and together they all make their attempts day after day after day. And with time, they start to change up their plan because there's no way this dude can hit all three of them. Well, I mean, at least that's the theory. And it was a theory that was quickly proven wrong. And as the days go on, we go to day 17, where Steve number four is trying to encourage Steve number two and tell him that he's strong, but Steve number two just doesn't want to hear it. But then when we go to day 18, Steve number three approaches Steve number five and he tells him, you know something, don't you? You know what's out there and that's what you're afraid of. But number five tells him that he doesn't know what or who's out there. And the only thing that he is afraid of is in here and in his head. But the next on day 19, Steve number one goes to have a talk with Steve number two. And in this talk, he tells him that you can do this. You're stronger than you think. We all know that. We all see it. And I don't understand how or why, but I think the dog was right. We're all the same man deep down inside. So that means if we can be strong, then you can too, because we're all Steve's. But you've been through the most, endured the worst, and you still have the biggest heart of any of us. That means you, you could be the strongest Steve of all. And with hearing this on day 20, Steve number two joins the group, but once again, nobody makes it out and the entire group gets sent back in. But with this happening, Steve number five finally comes out of his room. And when he does, he tells these guys that none of them know what they're doing, but he notices that they all have guts. And now with him seeing this, he lets them know that maybe they are more alike than what he thought. And with saying this, he lets the other Steves know that if they tell him everything that they saw, then he'll tell them how to get out of here. And with saying this, number five, he's got claws popped and everything. But then from here, we go from day 20 to day 33. And with how this is done, it is more or less hinted that within the 13 days, Steve one through four shared with number five everything that they knew to where then number five mapped out the plan of what everyone needs to do every step of the way. But as they make their way through, it begins the same way that number two had described it, with there being obstacles first, to where then there's like these platform structures that they gotta jump over. But then here, when we see the group make their way to the point where none of them have been beyond, 
this time there are five people standing in their way. And the next thing that we see from here is five silhouettes throwing shields and Steve number one telling the others that it's time to reach out and grab it. And when he says this, all the other Steves put their hands up. And I mean, number four, he just opens his mouth because I mean, he doesn't have hands. But it's here when this happens when each and every one of them catch their own shield. And it's in this moment when a boy says, congratulations, Steves, you've all passed the first stage of your boot camp. But let me tell you, it's only going to get harder from here. And as they look up, they see a ton of Captain America variants with what appears to be the Captain America from Marvel Apes, Earth 8101, your Cap Wolf who was turned into a werewolf by Nightshade, amongst a ton of others who then start to trickle in. But with seeing this, Robbie Reyes is kind of like, well, okay, yeah, this is a few people, but this ain't enough because a war is coming and they've got to get their numbers up. But nonetheless, they're going to take this as a win since they got Weapon America to pop his claws again. And from here, the trio then make their way to go to Earth 49978 to recruit another Steve Rogers who was caught in a gamma explosion. And when we go back to Steve number one's room, we find that what he was drawing on the wall was a shield with them signing just underneath it, Steve Rogers was here right next to the tally marks of the 33 days that he was here. All right, so with this one, we head over to Earth 56, 337. And as we arrive here, we find Thor in the Himalayas, where at this point, he's reached the summit of one of the mountains. And even though prior to this, he had been told that no one else has ever ventured out here and returned, to him, this was just perfect. Because prior to this point, this Thor had been searching for peace. And now that he's made his way here, he believes that he's found it for the first time in centuries. But for this Thor, this moment of peace and celebration, it isn't long lasted because just moments after he had made his way here, this huge thundercloud comes brewing up only for thunder to then strike with a very familiar object within it that comes striking down and barely missing him. But it's soon after where we find out that this object is Mjolnir, which has found Thor once again, even with Thor traveling to the ends of the earth to get away from Mjolnir. But also it's here we're told that the Thor of Earth 56 337 is haunted by a Mjolnir that was supposed to be his and how this hammer should have carried him between realms and between glories unimaginable. But yet and still here we are with Thor struggling to lift Mjolnir for what is possibly the 5,000th time. And yet again, much like before, he fails to do so. And as we continue, we're shown that this is precisely what happened when the Masters of Evil made their way to the Asgard of his universe. Even then, he failed to lift his hammer as Asgard burned all around him. And the outcome was later no different when the Masters of Evil made their way to his Midgard and conquered it as well. But even still, regardless for Thor, no matter where he would go or where he would wander, Mjolnir would still follow him. But the constant sound of thunder would only remind Thor of his inadequacy and his unworthiness. And we come to find that this is the reason why Thor journeyed to the far ends of the earth to find the most remote location that he could and get away from Mjolnir. But like we'd seen, Mjolnir still found him. And for Thor, we're told that to him, this is like his hatred and his depression following him and finding him. And for Thor, it's not only the hatred of the butchers who destroyed this world, but it's also the hatred of himself and his hammer, but more so himself. And this leads to Thor punching the hammer repeatedly until his fists are just a bloody mess. But shortly after, Thor is then met by the arrival of Lei Kong, the Thunderer, who in the 616 universe is the immortal martial arts master who trained the young men of Kung Lun. And as it's told, this is the guy who trained not only every fighter in this mystical city, but also any fighter who would eventually become an Iron Fist. And initially, his 616 counterpart had been said to have been doing this for thousands of years. But in Avengers Volume 8, Issue 13, when Jason Aaron gave us the origin of the first Iron Fist in the 616 universe, we were shown at the time, one million years ago, that he was there too. And even the original version of Lei Kung was known as the Thunderer. And he had been teaching Kung Fu, starting with cavemen, all the way up to Danny Rand and others after. And with the version that we're shown on Earth 56, 337, this Lei Kong the Thunderer, he's shown to have had a very similar history as far as his role in Kung Lun. But with him showing up here, the first thing that he does is tell Thor that he doesn't know how to throw a punch and that he's striking with rage and not focus. And such form will only hurt himself more than the thing that he intends to strike. And so from here, with Thor going on to ask him who he is, Lei Kong tells him, but then in response, he asks Thor if he's made his way here seeking enlightenment. Because if he has, unfortunately, he's a little too late. But then when Thor tells him that he's come here seeking oblivion, Lei Kong lets him know that he knows why Thor is here, even if Thor doesn't. 
but with them saying this and addressing Thor as God of Thunder. Thor's then like, don't call me that, I am the God of nothing. But then next, Lei Kung opens a portal to Kun Lun, where he lets Thor know that the Masters of Evil had destroyed this place too, even with it being hidden in the veil between dimensions. But from here, he goes on to let Thor know that their army fought for days until their Iron Fist fell, and many others fell soon after to where then the Masters of Evil burned everything that they found here, flesh and stone alike. But he then goes on to tell Thor, with the invaders' hunger for destruction and carnage, they didn't realize that one cannot burn a dragon. And his hero Lei Kung takes Thor to the entrance of the chamber of the immortal dragon, Shao Lao. And he goes on to tell Thor that it's from the heart of the immortal dragon, where the greatest weapon of all the heavens was birth, the almighty Iron Fist but all it's missing is a living vessel. So he then asks Thor if he wants to get revenge upon those who have burned the heavens to where then Thor is more or less like, who me? Like I've been nothing but unworthy. And as soon as he says this, Mjolnir then nudges him, which from there causes Thor to turn around swinging. But then it's here where Lei Kung puts the idea in Thor's head and lets him know that maybe his hands weren't made for lifting hammers and perhaps his training has already begun. And from there he tells Thor to hit the hammer again and again where from here Thor begins his training, or better yet as Lei Kung would describe, Thor continues his training. Because with Thor repeatedly punching this hammer, which is one of the strongest substances in all the realms, this buffets and builds the calluses on Thor's fists to the point of where they became hammers in their own right. Because throughout this training, Thor had been doing this for 30 days and 30 nights, while also sharpening his focus. But then after an additional 30 days, it was at this point when Mjolnir started to quiver, and all of a sudden, the immovable Mjolnir began to dodge, which from here took Thor's training to the next step. But also with him seeing this progression, it encouraged him to punch it harder, because it was also like Thor had made the hammer no pain which was something that was very new to Mjolnir. But after this phase of Thor's training, it came to a point where the hammer stopped dodging and it started to fight back. But as this happens, it's here where Mjolnir just brews up this huge thunderstorm. He strikes at Thor and Thor jumps out of the way to where then Lei Kong tells Thor that this isn't just thunder, but instead this is the hammer in a panic, quaking in fear. And the hammer thinks that Thor can be defeated in a bit of a bluster because it thinks that he's unworthy. And in the way of like your classic movie training montage, and let me know in the comments, what's your favorite movie training montage music? And it can be film or anime, to make that clear. But it's here where Lei Kong lets Thor know that this is his opportunity to show the hammer what kind of god he is. And he tells Thor that he's not the god of wind or rain, and he's not even the god of storms. But instead, he's the god that punches them. And I gotta say, when I saw this, I was like, yeah, it's pretty crazy. But for me, the training speech just kind of fell flat. I don't know, that's just me, I guess. But at this point now, with Thor punching the lightning, it's here where we find that he's beaten the hammer. He's broken its will. And at this point now, Thor has the option to lift the hammer. And Lei Kung tells him this and he asks him, will he claim it? Will he lift the hammer from here? And in response, Thor says no. So then Lei Kung is like, okay, good. And then he just smacks Thor, because now the next step of his training is fighting him. And it's here where he lets Thor know that fighting a floating hammer isn't gonna quite cut it as far as making him worthy to be the Iron Fist. But when he goes on to tell Thor that he is the last trial, Thunderer versus Thunder God, and it's right here where Thor is like, I told you not to call me that. To where from here, Thor then gives Lei Kong his Asgardian one punch, which sends the Thunderer across Kun Lun, crashing through the door that leads into the chamber of the immortal dragon Shao Lao. And really, it's after that one punch where Lei Kong is more or less like, okay, that's it, you pass. And he lets Thor know that it was an honor to train him and lead him to his destiny. But then he goes on to let Thor know that he's gotta come clean with him because the immortal dragon is dead, which is kind of a contradiction to the name, but I mean, here we are. But he goes on to let Thor know that eventually the dragon had withered and that it was never Thor's destiny to become the Iron Fist, but also he wasn't actually training Thor to become the Iron Fist or really to wield any new weapon for that matter, but instead he was training Thor to wield the weapons that he was already born with, the weapons that speak louder than thunder, to where from here he calls Thor the God of Fists. And I mean, once again, I gotta say, the speech, it did feel underwhelming, much like the one we were given earlier, but two things come to mind with seeing this. Like, the first one is, I would much rather see a powerful Thor who doesn't lift the hammer rather than seeing Thor become the Iron Fist. But then also, with the war that's to come, this guy better be able to throw hands. And I don't mean like on some regular exchanging blows with somebody, but I'ma need this dude to one punch doom the living planet. And then I'll be like, okay, yeah, this guy's valid. But at this point with Thor completing his training and becoming the God of Fists, 
he makes his way to go after the Masters of Evil, and he allows Mjolnir to tag along. But at this point, with him not being sure how he's gonna make his way to them, it's right here where Robbie Reyes and Tony Stark show up. And they're more or less like, hey man, you looking for a ride? And just like that, the Thor of Earth 56 337 joins the team as they prepare for the all out war against the Masters of Evil. Alright, so for this one, we begin by seeing a montage that takes us across the multiverse as we're shown a number of different versions of Carol Danvers accomplishing many feats high in the sky, whether it's defeating Hydra and taking their blimp, soaring the prehistoric skies on a pterodactyl, flying a jet at mock speeds, or just flying as your traditional Captain Marvel. And with seeing this, we're told that these are in fact visions that have been seen by Carol Danvers from an alternate reality who has never taken to the sky like the other Carols that she's seen in these visions every night because on her earth no good things allowed to fly and even though we're not given the specific designation of what earth this is we are told that this is a world that has been claimed by the dark phoenix of the masters of evil so much like what we'd seen with the black skull on earth 818 the reality of this world it's only a dark shadow of what it's supposed to be and on this earth the dark phoenix she's declared the skies to be off limits to anyone but herself and if anyone or anything takes to the skies they're shot down by the members of the hellfire church who do this as a form of worship to their queen the dark phoenix and we're shown an example of this as these lords of the hellfire church shoot down these eagles to the point of where they've shot down so many it's too much for them to eat so usually what they do they take the rotting leftovers and they feed them to the peasants which is where we find the carol danvers of this world among them but on this day we find carol a bit fed up and after being shoved she shoves back and as it turns out with her we discover that she's never eaten anything that flies which kind of had me thinking for a minute like you know there's plenty of things with wings that technically don't fly so that statement can be taken a number of ways but for carol of course with her attacking one of the lords of the hellfire church she's brutally reprimanded and moments after thrown back into her pit and when this happens we're told that the other slaves also hate carol because there's been rumors spread that she's some kind of witch, so many have chosen to believe it and hate her for that reason. But as she's thrown back in the pit, it's here where we're told the reason why she has a ball and chain. And as it turns out, this story took place many years back, when Carol tried to make a realization out of her visions and take to the skies. And for Carol, this was something that worked for a moment, only for her soon after to get shot down and have a ball and chain fastened around her neck. And from that time, every night, Carol would try to fly again by jumping while holding that ball and chain, hoping that one day, just one day, she would eventually be as strong as the carols that she sees in her visions. And she even admits for herself, some nights the frustration gets the best of her. And she thinks to herself, maybe she's wrong, maybe these visions are only dreams after all. And sometimes she thinks nothing is meant to fly, or to fly is to fall. But deep down inside, she knows, before the fall, there's always hope. So the next day when Carol Danvers was out, picking up everything that the lords of the Hellfire Church had shot down, she ended up finding a nest with a few young birds in it that now have no mother. So she ended up taking them in and feeding them gruel, which is all she had, while doing her best to keep them quiet. Because if anyone was to hear them, then they would be dead before they even had the chance to fly. And for Carol, with her feeding these birds, they grew. And during the time that they were feeding and growing, she kept on trying over and over again to jump out of that hole. But eventually it came to the point to where these birds were big enough to fly. And when they were, they flew out of there. And as soon as they did, they were seen by the lords of the Hellfire Church, who were ready to shoot these birds down in the name of their queen, the Dark Phoenix. But with hearing them approach, Carol wasn't about to let this happen. So she climbed her way out of that pit and she took these lords head on while using the ball and chain as a weapon. But during this scuffle, one of the lords shoot at Carol, but he hits the clasp on her neck that had her bound to the ball and chain, effectively breaking it. And with this happening, it takes a moment for Carol to realize that she's actually free. But when she does, she takes a leap and she goes soaring above the clouds, like she's up there. Her vertical is crazy now. And I swear, when this happens, there's a moment where she's in the air and it's kind of like a Jumpman logo like she's officially unlocked the ability to jump out the gym. But then also for the Carol Danvers of this world, now that she's free, she looks back knowing that she has to bring these lords to justice. And with her realizing this, it isn't long before we look back and see that she set the Hellfire Castle ablaze. And it's crazy to the point where these guys don't even know what's attacking them. 
and it's almost like a horror movie the way that Carol's jumping up into the clouds, or really more so the smoke from all the fire, and using it as cover as she jumps in and jumps out, snatching up these different lords and giving them lessons on flying, which is a bit of poetic justice with the way that she's taking these guys out. But after she's done, Carol doesn't stay here for long before she leaves, leaping away in an attempt to test her boundaries and see how high she can really go by testing out the higher, further, faster mantra that she's been telling herself this whole time. But with her leaping and soaring through the clouds, eventually she then runs into this huge hunk of metal, only to discover moments later that she's ran into the Omni Carrier with an entire crew of other Carol Danvers from other realities that have just recently made their way to this world looking for her. So from here, they get her settled as a part of the crew, but for this Carol, it's almost like her dream has come true, or better yet, her vision has become a reality, with her actually meeting those other strong versions of herself and becoming a member of the Carol Corps. But I'ma say it right now, this Carol Danvers needs a Jumpman logo on her costume, because not only is she jumping out the gym, but she literally got it out the mud. And from here going forward, they all head out, including Robbie Reyes, the All Rider, making their way to the next Earth in preparation for the war that's soon to come. Alright, so for this one, we begin with Earth 818 Tony Stark, making his way across the multiverse with Earth 616 Robbie Reyes, the All Rider, as well as the Deathlock. And at this point, the three of them have made incredible progress, putting together the Multiversal Avengers team. And as a result, they're heading towards the last stretch of their multiversal quest. And because of this, Tony decides that he wants to celebrate, even though he's having a bit of trouble keeping the liquor down during the turbulent ride. But when they stop for a moment, Tony goes on to say that the Masters of Evil have struck again and they've stolen all the booze in this universe except for this one last swig in this bottle so he then shrinks down as a solution but then deathlock comes over and he tells tony to stop playing around because they're not done which then has tony like wait well what do you mean we have just assembled the craziest team that you could imagine we got the star panther the strongest black panther who's ever lived we got one punch thor the god of fists the angriest punchiest thor out there we've got the howling commandos their own army of steve rogers as well as an insane air force packed with captain marvels in the carol corps so for tony who's still shrunken down and holding up this huge bottle that he's about to destroy like the body to bottle ratio is insane but tony goes on to tell deathlock that they've already assembled every pillar that is needed for the omniversal avengers and at this point he's ready to drink to that but deathlock lets tony know that he's wrong because there is still one pillar left and right away tony knows what and who that pillar is and that last pillar is tony stark so from here they make their way across the multiverse finding different tony starks and as we follow them and see this first one who for one is just drinking whiskey through the helmet he don't even bother to lift the face up like it's crazy but for this tony stark when he sees earth 818 tony along with the all rider and the deathlock he just goes into panic mode because he truly believes that these guys have made their way here from across the multiverse to take his liquor and in spite of them trying to tell this tony that they've come for his help this Tony then tells them that they can't help, no one can. The future's been stolen and he couldn't stop it. And with him speaking like this, 818 Tony is seeing a bit of himself in this guy. And aside from the obvious reasons, he picks up on this Tony's anxiety, self-hate, his fear of becoming emotionally invested in others, and he recognizes these traits. But as they're chasing this Tony, this guy just pretty much passes out in the air and he goes plummeting down, crashing into this huge explosion. And right away it has me like, man, they should have done something. They could have saved this guy. They could have. Oh, I mean, it <clears throat> it was a canon event. It, it, it was a canon event. It had to happen. But as I was saying, with this Tony's untimely demise, this caused 818 Tony to look at this and think like he never knew that there was another Tony Stark out there that was even more messed up than he is. So they stick around a bit and give the guy a proper burial. But not after long, Robbie Reyes is like, look, we're wasting time. The Omni Avengers need a Tony Stark to hold them together. But for 818 Tony, he doesn't want to go through this because for him, it's like looking in the mirror over and over and over again. And as for the Deathlock, he agrees with Robbie because amongst these different Tony Starks, there's got to be an ultimate Tony who can bring the others together. So for a moment, the Deathlock is like, well, if you're that Tony, then we're good. But then 818 Tony just pulls out his flask and takes a swig, which is kind of his passive way of saying like, nope, I'm not that guy. So from here, the three of them continue their search across the multiverse for the other Iron Man and the ultimate Iron Man. 
and on the next world that they travel to, they find a Tony Stark who was burnt at the stake because the people of his world believed that he was a witch, and only a few really understood that he truly was a brilliant mind who would make things out of other people's trash, and that he was someone who showed the potential of being a hero who would save the world one day. And I mean now, with seeing this, 818 Tony's getting the vibe of like, man, if this guy wasn't the one, then who is? And then next, they go to a universe where this Tony Stark transferred his mind into a robot body, the size of a celestial. And it was said in this universe that this new robot form that he had taken had been so big that it could no longer fit on his home planet. And at that point, it's kind of like, man, why? But with coming here, they fill him in and they tell him that they want him to join up and help save the multiverse. But at this point, this Tony is so far beyond his Earth and to the point where now he's just drinking other planets, which is probably the reason why he did this in the first place. But anyway, he tells 818 Tony and the others that he's not interested. And 818 Tony puts it together as they leave that the reason why this celestial-sized Tony made himself this way is because he figured the others would look like molehills once he's standing in the clouds. Because again, 818 Tony, he sees himself in these different variants. So it's painful for him seeing over and over again the things about himself that he hates the most. And as they arrive on the next world, we're told that they've seen at least 30 Tonys who've used their suits as bartenders, another two dozen who flew into the sun, and somewhere around another 50 who are in a catatonic state. But as they make their way here, they find that this Tony has never left the cave where he created his first suit because he keeps scrapping the suit and starting all over again. Because for the past 10 plus years, he's been an over perfectionist. And even when they get here and try to talk to him, he's just like, no, I can't talk. I'm too busy. I got to finish this suit so I can get out this cave. But as 818 Tony and the others look around, they realize that this Tony's captors have been dead for at least 10 years. And this Tony has never tried to use any of these suits to make his escape. And he's been so trapped in a state of fear and perfection that he's never even looked up to realize at this point he could just walk out of there. And after seeing this guy, 818 Tony tells Robbie and the Deathlock, that this Tony may be onto something. Like it might have been better had all the Tonys just stayed in their cave. And he lets them know after they visit the next Earth, he's gonna come back here in this cave and he's not leaving either. And when they go to this next Earth, they end up making their way to Stark Repair, where inside, 818 Tony finds himself speaking to a much older Tony Stark, who had spent his life running a repair shop where he was very content with helping people just by fixing things that were broken. But at this point, for this older Tony, his heart's been giving him problems and he doesn't know how much longer he's gonna last. And there comes a moment here while they're talking where 818 Tony just offers this guy one last drink, but this older Tony just turns it down. And he goes on to say that he doesn't drink because it takes a clear head to fix things. And his secret all these years running this shop is when it comes to fixing things, it takes one to know one. Which right there lets 818 Tony know that this older Tony knows him. And the older Tony goes on to say that he likes to believe that he knows why 818 Tony is here. Which is because more people are going to make their way to this place. Who are all going to need something that is broken to be fixed. And older Tony was hoping that he would come. So he'd have someone to pass it on to. So he tells 818 Tony that all of this is his. If he just promises to always. But suddenly just like that the older Tony passes. And even though he didn't finish his sentence, the conversation in itself caused 818 Tony to realize what he needs to do moving forward. So after pouring out some liquor for the dead homie, he makes his way back to the Hell Charger with all the booze that he had tucked away. Which, come to think of it, it's pretty crazy how much alcohol an Ant-Man can hide, given the specific motivation. But it's here where he makes use of the Hell Charger's trunk, which as a reminder, inside it has a portal to Hell. So Tony throws all the liquor in the trunk, and he detoxes for the next couple days, to where then eventually he makes his way back to the Tony who never left the cave. And he helps him make those steps out of that cave, while letting that Tony know that he's safe, he can come outside, and that he doesn't have to be perfect to take those steps out of the cave. because no Nobody really is. And then from here, he takes them back to Stark Repair to meet up and talk with other Tonys who are working through their issues. And really, as it turns out, it's almost like an AA meeting for the different Tonys across the multiverse, where all these Starkaholics can come together in a safe space, talk about their issues, and tell their individual stories to one another, which is definitely an AA meeting for Starkaholics. But soon after, we come to find that this method ends up working out, and eventually, more and more Tonys end up joining. Because when it comes to fixing things that are broken, it takes one to know one. 
But now that we finally have all of these Tony Starks together, we now have the final pillar that was needed to bring the Omni Avengers together so that they can all take the fight to the Masters of Evil. Alright, so with how this is done, it's given to us like story time pretty much because it takes us back to the 1 million BC era where we're shown Lofi, King of the Frost Giants of Jotunheim, had fallen in love with Hive, the war bearer and mother of infestation, where in her case, she's from the negative zone. And as we're told, these two came to Earth 1 million years ago to consummate their love through conquest and slaughter, which as it turned out, the two of them produced billions of war vermin, which were on the track to annihilating humanity until the Avengers 1 million BC stepped in and put these war vermin in check, which for the humanity of Earth 616, this was great because otherwise they would have been out of here. But for Lofi and Hive, this horde represented the power of their union and it was destroyed by the Avengers 1 million BC in a battle that lasted 70 days and 70 nights. And as we're told, this union wasn't meant to be, which is for obvious reasons, because I mean, imagine Earth 616 if it did. But nonetheless, this caused Hive, the war bearer, to retreat in shame back to the negative zone. And for Lofi, his rage became a roaring blizzard. And that day, he swore a blood debt against all the gods and man beasts of Midgar, vowing that one day he would return and turn this world into ash and slush. But soon after this battle was over, the Avengers of this time would discover the price that they would pay for this victory, which in this case was the death of the first Black Panther. Mosi, who the Phoenix described as the best of men, and she even went on to say, may the men of this world grow up to be as he was. But for Odin, who at this time, one million years ago, was still very far removed from having much of any empathy towards humanity, he told the Phoenix on this day that the Panther fought well, but much like she said, he was just a man, and it's best that the Phoenix doesn't get too attached to any of them, because they don't last long, they're not like us. Which, with hearing this, it put the Phoenix in a rage because a great man died this day, a man who was their comrade in arms. So she demands that Odin shows some respect. But again, this is Odin and he only respects his own passions, which at this point in time is referring to what the two of them once were. Which for the Phoenix, she's just disgusted with Odin missing the significance of this moment. So she tells him for someone who claims to be omnipotent, you see very little sometimes. But for Odin, he tells her, I am the way and the wrath and the wonder, and I see what shall be, and how to make it so. Which really is Odin saying so many things. How he views situations within the hundreds or even tens of thousands of years. How he doesn't see the life of humanity as significant, with it being such a small fraction of his own. But also for him with looking in the years beyond, he's really telling her that he knows what he wants, and he knows how to make that happen. Which is something that we'll come back to. Because right now, with the Phoenix being in the moment, she heads over to the Panther tribe to give them her condolences for the loss of their guardian, who was more courageous than any of these other Avengers combined, with the others being gods or just wielding insane powers while the Panther fought alongside of them when he was just a man. So the Phoenix lets the Panther people know that she never knew their guardian's real name and she would like to know it. And also, if there's any protection that they request, just say the word and she'll give it. But in response, a woman from the tribe just tells her that his name was Mosi, and if you wish to protect us, then forget we exist. And from there, the victorious heroes went their separate ways, which almost seems like this is Jason Aaron giving a new explanation to what would later be the tribes of Wakanda, but also possibly the new reasoning to why the people of Wakanda will keep to themselves hundreds of thousands of years in the future. But after this, we then jump forward not too long after, where Odin has called for the Avengers to make haste and gather, and with doing so, making it seem like it was an emergency. But when Agamotto, the Iron Fist, Starbrand, and Ghost Rider showed up, they quickly realized that this wasn't anything like that. And initially, instead of Odin just straight up telling them what it was, he would only say obscure things like, I brought you here for a day like no other. And how, for him, the trouble lies in his heart. But then as the Phoenix shows up, he's then like, oh, and here comes the cure. <laughs> but as the Phoenix arrives, she's like, what happened? Are we under attack? And the Iron Fist is like, hey, this has got to be important because with all of us here, we've pretty much left the Earth vulnerable and unprotected. So Odin then leads them all to a doorway while telling them that this is a greater day than any other that they had protecting Midgard because today, him and the Phoenix are getting married which is definitely news to her. But also this goes back to what Odin said about him seeing what shall be and how to make it so, which in a very creepy way also points back to conversations that he'd had with the Phoenix, with him summoning her to have little talks, 
when at the time she was like why you talking to me ain't you got wives that you could be talking to and back then odin would be like yeah i got a few but they ain't like you which for the two of them was a time prior to this when the phoenix was interested because they were together for a while but with what odin wants the phoenix to be and who she actually is they couldn't be any further from the same so in response the phoenix slaps fire on the son of boar which in the marvel universe i believe is the first time the fire got slapped on anybody at least in jason aaron's 1 million bc with this portion of history kind of being like its own thing before the recorded history of man and i mean it may have happened in muspelheim prior to this but who knows but for the phoenix she just tells odin that he's a fool of a god and for odin he's just like well i don't understand which for him i get it he's the king he just gets what he wants he just doesn't know any different but the phoenix understands this too and she's like he never will and immediately after the phoenix shoots out of asgard heading to earth with the intention of leaving everyone and everything here but she hesitates before taking off because she knows if she leaves the earth will wither before it blooms and even now the host firehair could feel the stars calling and the phoenix entity wanted to spread her wings and fly to new worlds but she couldn't leave before she left this world in better hands than what it's in now and not too long after we find that the phoenix approached gia the goddess of earth with a proposal because the phoenix knew that it couldn't stay on earth for too much longer without succumbing to its true nature and consuming this world with fire but she can't just leave because after she turned down odin's hand in marriage he turned his back on humanity but since odin's been asking a lot of other goddesses to marry him so the phoenix asked gia to say yes to odin or at the least give him a child that would be a benevolent god and though gia initially hesitated not long after she agreed to do it with her noticing that the phoenix adored this planet as much as she does so gia told the phoenix that she would give odin a chance and if this works out then the phoenix will be as much as a mother to this child as she is but after this we then jump forward many years where the day came when gia and odin had their child where on this day, Lofi, king of the frost giants, returned to Midgard to make good on the blood debt that he believed that he was owed. And during his attack, he struck the newly born Thor, stopping his heart and making his body as cold as ice. And with Gia crying for help, in this moment, the phoenix host, Firehair, she immediately knew why. The cosmic force of chaos and rebirth had chosen her. So she quickly grabbed the ice cold infant and shot off into the sky with the phoenix burning like never before to breathe the fires of life back into the child. The child of the goddess of Midgard, the all father of Asgard, and the fire bird from beyond the stars for a child whose first breath was a flame, flame and thunder in the skies of earth, a child who would be named Thor. But soon after, with the phoenix returning young Thor to Gia, Odin told the phoenix that he's taking his child to Asgard and that the phoenix needs to stay away from his family. So going forward, the phoenix left. But every time she heard the sound of thunder, it reminded her of this day and it was too much for her to bear. All right, so at this point, with us jumping back in and now having the multiversal Avengers assembled, we begin here with Captain Fury, who's single-handedly attacking the helicarrier Zeta, which belongs to the Goblin Corps. And initially, they don't bring out too much to stop him because they figure he's just one guy and this will be over pretty quick. But when Captain Fury is suddenly accompanied by Deathlock and Earth-818 Tony Stark, the Goblin Corps notices that there's more happening here than what they thought. And though it seems like this is just a random world that they've come to that's been taken over by the masters of evil through the course of this we also discover that robbie reyes the all rider came here because the slain prehistoric ghost riders told him to but then next when the all rider lands on the front of their helicarrier turning it into his latest hell ride suddenly the goblin corps realizes that they've lost this fight before they even knew that it started but while they're here, Deathlock tells the Tony Stark of Earth-818 that he just got a message from the Avengers Tower at Infinity's End, telling him that time is up, the multiversal recruiting is over, and it's time to bring this army home. And with Tony hearing this, he's kind of excited because he's like, yeah, finally I get to meet this mysterious Avenger Prime. But for the Deathlock, he's still a bit worried because even still, with all the multiversal Avenger recruiting that he's done, he still doesn't believe that they have enough to take on the Masters of Evil in their army. But Tony tells him, look at what Robbie Reyes just did with him turning that helicarrier into a, the helicarrier which definitely doesn't sound as impressive as it looked. But for Tony, the way that he sees it, he'll take one Robbie Reyes over a hundred Captain Americas or Thors any day. But for Robbie, who's now the all rider, he's kind of in his own world, standing off to the side by the car, because sometimes when you carry the whole team, you just don't want to be bothered because you may want a little space or privacy. 
But at this time, with Robbie taking a moment, he hears voices calling out to him from his trunk. And when he goes to take a look, he finds that it's other Ghost Riders who have fallen at the hands of the Masters of Evil who are calling out to the All Rider, saying, why have you forsaken us? Another spirit of vengeance has fallen. All Rider, avenge us. And as crazy as it seems, it makes sense that these other Riders are doing this because the Hell Charger already has a portal to Hell in the trunk. So at some point, all of these Riders was in Hell and they was like, you know what? Let's take this portal that leads to the All Riders trunk and send a message because we need vengeance and we need it now so the all riders gotta do something and though this is still robbie reyes currently he's found himself consumed by the all rider persona so tony and the deathlock approach him with this being one of the things that the deathlock was concerned about so tony tells him like look man we're about to head back to avengers tower and when we get there avengers prime can help you out so he doesn't have to lose himself in this whole process but then robbie's just like no I'm not going to Avengers Tower. So he chains Tony and Deathlock to the ground so that he can go after the Masters of Evil by himself. Cause the All Rider doesn't want to wait any longer. He wants to serve vengeance and penance now. So after this, we then head over to the Masters of Evil just after they destroyed another group of Avengers 1 million BC. And with seeing the Masters of Evil here, I gotta say, seeing the Black Skull kind of threw me off because back in issue four, we saw he was defeated and given a sentence of forever penance. So with seeing him again now, there's really no explanation given. And I assume the logic here is he was sentenced in the present day and he still has his symbiote back in 1 million BC. So it was one of those things I saw and I was like, all right, just roll with it, I guess. But while they're here, the All Rider shows up and he starts controlling the Black Skull symbiote, just like we saw Robbie do in Avengers Forever issue three. But for the Black Skull, when Robbie does this now, it's not even familiar to him. And it completely catches the Masters of Evil off guard, cause the All Rider then uses the symbiote to take down King Killmonger, almost as if he's picking them off one by one before revealing himself to them. But then suddenly, with a very disrespectful entrance, the All Rider comes in, running over the Berserker Wolverine while hitting Kid Thanos and chaining up the Dark Phoenix all in one shot. But at first, the Masters of Evil were seeing this and thinking, who would be dumb enough to come after them? But as Robbie's revealed who he is, with him attacking every single one of them except the Doom Above All, the Dark Phoenix immediately knows that this is no common rider, and whoever they're facing here is more powerful than any rider they've contested before. Which has the Doom Above All like, man, one rider did all that? But as the All Rider approaches the Doom Above All and Ghost Goblin, the Ghost Goblin recognizes him, and he remembers Robbie taking down an army of Black Skulls on Earth 818. But nonetheless, he still goes after the All Rider because for this Norman Osborn, the Ghost Goblin, he's aware that killing a Ghost Rider is difficult, nearly impossible, but he's already killed 417. So he's just kind of like, hey, what's one more? And as Norman goes after Robbie, the All Rider, Norman Osborn goes on to say how he's the richest man in the multiverse. He's got Elder Gods on payroll, which is how he became the Ghost Goblin. But to me, that's another thing where I'm just like, hmm. I don't know, buddy, because if any of you guys are familiar with the origin of the Spirit of Vengeance, which I did a video on like four years ago, but in that origin, which was also written by Jason Aaron, he gave us a story called Heavens on Fire, which showed us when the Spirit of Vengeance was created prior to Zarathos, who is the guy that Mephisto is stealing it from. But rather than make a whole debate right here, I put a link down in the description so you guys can check that video out and come back and tell me in the comments what you think. But from what it seems with the Ghost Goblin going against the All Rider, this power that he bribed to get from an Elder God, it's just not enough, which I was glad to see because that checks out. And last but not least, when the Doom Above All sees that the All Rider has single-handedly taken down his team, to him, he sees this as finally getting a challenge because prior to this, he's bodied gods, star brands, and phoenixes with little to no effort. And he's grown weary of his crusade feeling like it's been on easy mode. But the All Rider quickly tells Doom that he's not a challenge. He's not that. But instead, he's all the pain that Doom has inflicted. He's every one of Doom's sins given flesh. In Fist, he's the rage of all the worlds that Doom's ravaged. The All Rider is the vengeance of infinity. And the All Rider tells him, I am penance, your penance, Doom. As he then goes on to just walk through everything that the Doom above all throws at him which is pretty nuts. With us knowing that the Doom Above All is an amalgamation of sorcery from across the multiverse. But as this is happening, what we're also told is that this is killing Robbie because for him to end the Doom Above All, the full force of the All Rider must be unleashed, which will end the reign of the Masters of Evil, which will then effectively stop Mephisto's plans. But if Robbie does this, there's no going back. 
but this is a choice that Robbie is willing to make, and not for the reason that some would think, which is to save trillions. But for Robbie, he makes the decision to sacrifice himself in a heartbeat because he knows that this will save his little brother Gabe. But before Robbie's able to fully unleash the All Rider, the Deathlock intervenes because he doesn't believe in sacrificing Robbie Reyes to save the multiverse. And honestly, I can't tell if it's admirable or asinine. Because if one dude wants to sacrifice himself to save the multiverse, and that person has made that decision, what right does Deathlock have to take it from him? Because soldiers have given their lives for a fraction of that many people. And with saying that, I can already hear MCU Tony Stark. But imagine if somebody stopped him from saving the universe. And also, not to get too far ahead of where we're at right now, but the Deathlock is doing this because in spite of his overall doubts, he believes that Robbie at least has a better chance of going back home to his little brother if he teams up with the Multiversal Avengers. But again, for me, if somebody wants to end it and they're capable of ending it, don't stop them in the process of ending it. Because not only are you giving the villains another chance to win, but also when the war gets started and other heroes die then it's kind of like what was the whole point but either way i digress but at this point with robbie saved tony stark ant-man is still in the process of shrinking the doom above all into oblivion but before he can finish the dark phoenix comes back which now switches the focus to getting robbie out of there because robbie's still weakened and these other guys aren't going toe to toe with the dark phoenix which really just goes back to what i was saying they should have just let the man do his thing but then deathlock tells tony to get robbie out of there as he single-handedly goes after the Masters of Evil himself as a bit of a distraction for them to get away, but at the same time, it's one of those slow motion moments with a Deathlock knowing that he's about to die, which, I mean, it worked well enough for Tony and Robbie to get away, but even still, as far as the other people who are going to die, I put that on Deathlock, because looking back, I still don't think it was the best decision, but it did make the series longer, because going forward, the Masters of Evil are still intact, and for the Doom of Evolve, who currently isn't above much, the Stark Particles will eventually wear off, and he'll soon be a full-grown menace once again. Alright, so for this one, we begin in the 1 million BC era, with Agamotto, the Sorcerer Supreme at the time, checking out a disturbance in a cave. And though he's aware the primitives can spook quite easily, he still goes in to check it out. And what he ends up finding is one of the local cavemen, overwhelmed by a horde of otherworldly mind maggots. And even still with seeing this, this isn't too strange for Agamotto, because to him, with being the world's first Sorcerer Supreme, he's constantly protecting humanity from all sorts of bizarre and otherworldly threats. So with him finding this caveman, this guy, he takes him back to his Sanctum Sanctorum, which is a volcano, which I gotta say is not too bad of a choice if you don't want anybody just running up in there. But nonetheless, with him bringing this guy in, Agamotto is able to make sure that he removed all the parasites while also stitching this man's soul back up to avoid him later having any spiritual infections. Which right there, man, dude, you got soul stitches. Like, how you so messed up, you gotta get your soul stitched back together. That's deep. But also Agamotto admits, being the world's first and only source of Supreme, it can be a thankless job. It could be a friendless job. It could even be lonely at times. But with how he sees it, it at least gives him something to do. It keeps him occupied. And here, when he's done helping this caveman and stitching his soul back up, he even goes as far as to share different herbal recipes with the local people so that they can heal themselves or even expand their minds with hopes that mankind will develop some form of gratitude in the centuries to come. But while Agamotto is out here sending this guy back to his village, he suddenly senses that he's not alone. So he does a revealing spell to see who's there. And it's none other than Mephisto who shows up giving Agamotto a bit of a spoiler concerning humanity and them ever showing signs of gratitude. By telling Agamotto at best, they'll call him a devil-worshipping warlock and burn him at the stake. So with Mephisto showing up, Agamotto's aware that he has something to do with the increased amount of strange activity. So he asks Mephisto, what is he up to now? Because at this point in the past, Agamotto has defeated Mephisto a number of times before. But instead of Mephisto just laying out his whole plan and what he's up to, he tells Agamotto to use those magical eyes, those eyes of Agamotto, to see what happens next. And right away, Agamotto begins to see countless worlds across the multiverse being ravaged and the great heroes of prehistory on those worlds who were much like his Avengers 1 million BC, slaughtered with the future of their worlds completely changed. 
Which for the record, aside from us knowing that these things are true, keep in mind for Mephisto, he's only sharing this information by way of telling Agamotto to take a look because he wants him to know this for a number of reasons, which we'll talk about as they unfold momentarily. But the first is made pretty clear when Mephisto asks Agamotto what happened to his Avengers, which right here is where we more or less get the news that the Avengers 1 million BC had broken up, which is something that happened as a result of the stunt that Odin pulled in the Avengers 1 million BC one shot with his surprise wedding for the Phoenix, which she wasn't too happy about. And really this stunt was more like the hair that broke the camel's back because prior to this they had already lost their Black Panther which didn't make the Avengers 1 million BC break up but it definitely got them closer to it with it showing how little Odin cared about mortals and the Panther people at this time moving into isolation while telling the heroes to forget they ever existed and I'll leave a link in the description for anyone who needs to get caught up and get more of the details of how the Avengers 1 million BC broke up but again with Mephisto coming here he drops that bit of information on Agamotto and then Mephisto tells him that it was 312. 312 is the amount of times that they fought before where Agamotto made him look like a fool. So needless to say, Mephisto also had a bit of incentive to shake Agamotto up alongside of him delivering this message. But after this clash with Mephisto, a very worn out and exhausted Agamotto, who's nearly freezing to death, is found by the prehistoric Ghost Rider. And for a moment they catch up a bit with Ghost Rider telling Agamotto about his recent escapades like when he came across this one guy who told his tribe that he spoke for the great light in the sky and how the great light told him that he was the only guy in the tribe who was allowed to breed and the tribe went with it. But things like this just had the prehistoric Ghost Rider thinking how at one time he believed if he served enough penance humanity would rise above its nature. But over the years that just doesn't seem to be the case. And with them knowing that Agamotto can see the future, he asks Agamotto, will it ever change? Will sin ever end? And Agamotto tells him, no it won't. Because the more that mankind grows and spreads, the more new ways they will devise to slay and defile one another. And hearing this gets the prehistoric ghost rider a little heated, no pun intended. And he asks Agamotto if he has any idea how much torment he has to endure to be this. So his next question is why? Why is he doing this? Why is he giving so much to a fight, to a war, that the wizard is saying that they'll never win? And Agamotto just doesn't have that answer. So not long after, Agamotto goes to see the Iron Fist and she gives him a bit of advice telling him that perhaps the problem is that he sees too much and if his eyes are constantly on the horizon, then he's gonna miss what's right at his feet. And she goes on to let him know, in spite of humanity having the capacity to destroy themselves and eventually make ruin of the entire planet, humanity may surprise them, but they'll never know unless they fight for humanity to have that chance. And Agamotto goes on to tell her that he understands that she's been carrying on that fight and she lets him know that she's also picked up some new allies along the way. As the prehistoric Moon Knight walks up with the meme mug because he don't know if Agamotto's a friend or a foe. So Agamotto tells the Iron Fist his concerns for what's to come and she tells him that she'll be there whatever the fight and he appreciates hearing that because he's gonna take all the help that he can get. So next he makes his way to go find the big guy, the prehistoric Starbrand who sought out isolation after the band broke up because though these heroes were forged through suffering one way or another, some of them make peace with it like the Iron Fist and for others like the Starbrand, that pain is just constantly tearing them apart. So initially when Agamotto shows up, he offers to take away Starbrand's memories, just the ones that are causing the pain. But Starbrand, he doesn't want to let go of the pain. Instead, he wants to make others feel it and he wants Agamotto to point him to the ones who need to feel it which pretty much means Starbrand is ready to come back and fight what's coming. So next, Agamotto makes his way to the Panther people, who since the loss of their Black Panther, Mosi, they've gone into isolation up in the mountains. And when they see Agamotto, they just greet him with one word, and it's no. So next, Agamotto makes his way to Asgard, where Odin's just been drinking and thinking, and really he doesn't care who they fight, he just wants to get out. Because with the recent birth of Thor, it's been thunder day and night. So Odin really just wants an excuse to catch a break. And though he agrees to come back down to Midgard and help, he still believes that humanity doesn't deserve it. And with him agreeing to go with Agamotto, Odin lets him know that he has one condition, which is that the Phoenix cannot be there because she is not welcome in his presence ever again. And Agamotto's just like, well, he would tell Odin that they need all the help they can get. But as it stands, the Phoenix has already left Earth, so it doesn't even matter. 
And now with the new team assembled, including the addition of prehistoric Moon Knight, Agamotto goes on to tell them how the other day the Ghost Rider asked him, why do we bother to do what we do when no matter how hard we fight, the war will not end. And he goes on to say that he could tell them that they are heralds of an age of wonders and how they'll pave the way for other heroes to step in and protect the earth. But Agamotto's like, no, I'll, I'll just show you. And as they all look up, they see the modern day Avengers who have just made their way back to the prehistoric past after chasing Mephisto back in time all the way here to what is also known as the prehistoric Genesis point. All right, so in our last talk, we saw the Avengers 1 million BC run into the modern day Avengers who had just made their way back in time to the prehistoric era, which is where we're picking up from in this video for the most part. But before we get into that, I wanna take a moment to talk about why the current day Avengers are here, how they got here, as well as the situation of the star brand baby turning into the star brand old lady, cause a few of y'all have been asking about that. So I wanted to go over it really quickly because this is the last part of three separate pieces that are all coming back together now. Because this all began in the 2018 Avengers series by Jason Aaron, where at the time, at around issue 54 or so, when the Death Hunters story concluded, which we covered on the channel and I got that link below. But when Death Hunters concluded, the story split with one side of it continuing in the 2018 Avengers series and the other half of this branching off into Avengers Forever, which is the story that we've been following all the way up to this point with the Deathlock and Tony Stark from Earth 818, the Ant-Man, assembling the multiversal Avengers after traveling throughout the multiverse, which like we saw not too long ago, this part's done. The multiversal team is assembled. And as for the other two, first we got the Avengers 1 million BC. Their story was covered within a couple of one shots as well as in the Avengers series, much of which we've covered already with these guys assembling and disassembling and now meeting the modern day Avengers, which takes us to number three because for the modern day team, they've been doing quite a bit of time traveling as they went after Mephisto, who was trying to unravel the Avengers past, which introduced the modern day Avengers to countless other heroes along the way, with them knowing that ultimately they need to save the Avengers 1 million BC, with this team being the cornerstone to the birth era of what would later be a world of heroes, which again made it a priority to protect the Avengers 1 million BC at all costs. So during their chase for Mephisto, Brandy Selby, the star brand baby, gave this fight everything she had, going constantly without sleep, cause she knew the more she used her powers, the faster she would age. So she just figured if she's not gonna live long, then she's gonna try and make the biggest impact within the short amount of time that she has, regardless of Carol Danvers trying to tell Brandy to sit this one out entirely. Cause none of them really knew how far she would age or how far Brandy could actually go until her body eventually would give out. And when the time came when Brandy got her shot to go after Mephisto, she exerted her full power, which was precisely what the team needed to take them 1 million years in the past. But unfortunately, this came at the cost of Brandy Selby aging rapidly, even though she was just an infant a few weeks ago. And now all of this brings us up to speed with the modern day Avengers finally finding the Avengers 1 million BC. But for the prehistoric heroes, they're not quite sure exactly who the modern day heroes are or why they're here for that matter. And at first they're a bit cautious because if you guys remember, Mephisto already told Agamotto about the multiversal masters of evil who have hunted down prehistoric Avengers on multiple worlds. But before Agamotto can get to say that he senses that they're already here, he's immediately attacked by someone causing him to just burst into flames which then causes the other prehistoric Avengers to believe that it's the modern day Avengers who are doing this, which is an assumption that is instigated by Odin because he sees that they have a Phoenix on their side. And because of his recent falling out with the Phoenix, Odin believes that this is some sort of retaliation, which makes sense if you try to look at it through his lens. So it's not difficult for him to convince his allies to let loose on these guys. And once the fight starts, it gets wild quick because you have both Captain America and Thor versus the star brand who gives them a run for their money. And of course, Odin, he goes for Maya because she's the modern day Phoenix, which then has him fighting against her and Valkyrie. But with all of this going on, I kind of got mixed feelings about it because on one hand, the logic is there for these two teams to be fighting. But on the other hand, it's so predictable and it happens so often when different teams or different heroes meet up, which just makes it one of those tropes that can be necessary at times. But when it happens, I'm now I'm just like, it better be good. 
because this one, it has its moments, but what I appreciate about it most is that it doesn't hog up the whole story, or even the whole issue for that matter. But while everybody was kung fu fighting, the Iron Fist made her way over to Agamotto, who is in excruciating pain at the moment, but he's able to at least let her know that these visitors are not the enemy. So she asks him, then who is? Which is a question that now takes us to another fight that's happening nearby. But before we get to that, we head back to just moments before the modern day Avengers and the prehistoric Avengers got into it. And we make our way to the Avengers Tower at Infinity's End, where we find the Avenger Prime, whose identity isn't quite revealed yet, because later on we're gonna get into the whole backstory. But for right now, with us seeing Avenger Prime make his way from Infinity's End to Earth 616 in the distant past, it's done in a way where it's like this guy's identity is still a mystery. But of course, with one look, I know, you know, we know who this is. But for the sake of the story, in the moment, I'm just gonna pretend like this is only Avenger Prime, because when we do get to his backstory, it's really good. But when he gets here to Earth 616 in the prehistoric past, Avenger Prime is suddenly approached by Mephisto. And at first, Mephisto's just talking like Earth 616 is already his, because he's been putting in work here for some time, even at this point in the past. So he asks Avenger Prime what brought him here to his Earth. And Avenger Prime tells him that he came here to watch Mephisto lose, like he usually does, only for Mephisto to then point out that it doesn't seem to be that way, with the Masters of Evil succeeding and taking over countless worlds across the multiverse, which has now caused Avenger Prime to leave the protection of his tower. So Avenger Prime just lets Mephisto know that he's very capable of protecting himself, and those other Earths weren't 616, as he looks over the ledge and whispers, Avengers assemble. And like we'd seen down below, that's something that's kind of a work in progress. But for now, just know that the Avenger Prime, he's the one who's calling and pulling the Avengers together, as opposed to Mephisto, who's working on pulling them apart. Which now brings us up to speed with the two fights that are happening simultaneously. Cause it's here when Mephisto tries to stab Avenger Prime in the back where the two of them start to go at it. And Avenger Prime tells Mephisto that he's not worried about taking him on one on one. Cause he knows Mephisto's not powerful enough here to overwhelm him. And regardless to what happens here today, the Avenger Prime has assembled a team far greater than anything Mephisto could imagine. So Mephisto's like, yeah, okay, okay, you got some good points. But who said anything about fighting one on one? as another hand comes out from behind Avenger Prime, stabbing him in the back, and the Council of Mephistos just come rushing in from every angle. Meanwhile, down bottom with the Avengers fighting the other Avengers, both Thor and Odin decide that they have had enough, and it gives us this moment where the two of them send their Mjolnirs flying at each other at the same time, which is kind of funny when you think about it, because I can't help but to imagine both hammers racing towards each other, and in the last moment before impact, both of them are just kind of like, hold up, Wait a minute, because they're both Mjolnir. But either way, this causes a huge explosion, knocks everybody out, except for Agamotto, who's finally free from his torment. And for a moment, he's just walking around and looking kind of like, wow, so this is how the world's gonna end, with heroes fighting heroes. And at first, it seems like he's talking to himself until he tells someone, you must be loving this. And it's right here where we see that he's talking to the doom above all. And right away when this doom shows up, there's just this looming feeling that something really bad is about to happen. And he doesn't waste any time getting down to it, cause Doom asks Sakamoto if he knows how many Sorcerer Supremes that he's been through prior to him. And before Agamotto can even guess the answer, Doom is just like, neither do I, to only then bind up Agamotto and take his eyes out. Cause the Doom above all did not come here to play. And he tells Agamotto, tonight I dine on your eyes, and then your world entire as he turns around and sees the star brand approaching and for a moment it almost seems like he forgot that he was holding captain marvel so he just tosses her over to the side and he charges after doom who is just like impress me and doom supreme tells star brand he's got all the power of the stars but he's just a man on the inside so he looks inside the star brand where he sees that he's burdened with man's sentiments and memories he has a man's pain of loss a weak man's rage so he tells the star brand this is why you fail, only for the star brand to break out of his hold, grab his head, and tell the Doom above all, no, that is why I smash. So Doom then calls for the bone bending spirits of the winding way, as he tells the star brand, no one smashes Doom. And after this, when the other Avengers start getting up, they just see this big red ball with veins popping out, rolling down the hill. And as it turns over, they see the star brand's face on it which is not only wild, but the doom above all, he uses this kind of like an intro to his speech. 
because next he just hovers over the Avengers, telling them how he's conquered so many other worlds with heroes stronger than them who all believed that they stood together that they could save their worlds. And they all believed this up until the moment where they died at our feet. And as he says this, the other masters of evil then step into the frame. And with them stepping in, it's like, we already know. These guys aren't here to play fight like the Avengers was just doing with each other. These are some killers. And since the last time that the modern day Avengers have seen the masters of evil, from then up until now, the multiversal masters of evil have collected quite a bit of XP. So now, this marks the beginning of the battle for Dawn. And going back to Mephisto, we see that his variants have placed a number of knives in Avenger Prime's back, as 616 Mephisto lets him know that this Earth is the last piece, and it must fall. And he also goes on to tell Avenger Prime, for the second time, that he was foolish for leaving the Watchtower at Infinity's End, but this time he says it not because the Avenger Prime left, making himself a target, but this time he says it because the Avenger Prime left the tower, unprotected as Mephisto then opens a portal to Infinity's End, and he tells Avenger Prime, this time, the devil gets the garden, as we see the Council of Mephistos are already there. All right, so for this one, we return to Earth 616 in the prehistoric past, right where we left off, with the Masters of Evil showing the modern day Avengers and the Avengers 1 million BC that they ain't playing no games. And not only by making an example out of the prehistoric star brand, with balling them up and having them roll down and make a trail, but also this trail made a little platform for the Masters of Evil to stand on, so it's like a little bit extra disrespect put on it. So quickly, Tony and Cap tell the modern day Avengers, this is the fight for everything, for their entire timeline. So they've got to stop the multiversal masters of evil right here and right now at all costs. Only for the Dark Phoenix to more or less tell him that yeah, the pep talk's cute, just before blasting the whole team with an attack that even Kid Thanos and Ghost Goblin think was a bit too much. And not because they want to go easy on these guys by any measure, but rather because they want to get a piece of the action too. So the Dark Phoenix tells her Berserker to go in and finish off anything that's still squirming around. So her Berserker Wolverine jumps in and immediately he gets overwhelmed by the fiery bone chains of prehistoric Ghost Rider who turns up the heat so crazy that it melts the Berserker Wolverine's adamantium. And while the Ghost Rider is doing this, I will say that there's a bit more going on with the Ghost Rider that we'll get deeper into in just a little bit because his over the top attack on the Berserker Wolverine it's stemming from a few different places heading into this, and we'll peel back more of those layers along the way. But with the Ghost Rider melting the adamantium on this berserker, his mammoth then steps in, stomping on the berserker, splashing adamantium everywhere. And it's almost like, man, what we doing, fatalities now? Like, what's, what's really going on? And the Ghost Rider makes it clear to the Masters of Evil by letting them know that he did this as payback for what happened to Starbrand. But like I said, there's more layers to this that we'll peel back in a little bit. And next, we see that the Phoenix Maya Lopez shielded the others with her flames, followed by Thor and Odin, who both bring forward the Avengers of the past and present to come together into one huge team to take on the multiversal masters of evil. Because also leading up to this, we were told that this was the only way that they would have a fighting chance against the multiversal masters of evil. And it was almost like they had to see it to believe it. And I mean, no pun intended in the case of Agamotto, who's not really seeing much of anything right now. But instead, it's more like the sacrifice that him and Starbrand have given are not in vain. And in this fight, you got a lot of the heroes putting their differences aside as they team up against the masters of evil in groups of two or three, like Jane who goes to save the younger Odin from the doom above all. Even though her and Odin have their differences, she puts them aside because her and the other modern day Avengers know if the masters of evil win and seize control of this Genesis point, then it will actually change their history, which is something that Jason Aaron is leaning into with this one. And it's why this fight is so important because usually when you have someone, hero or villain, travel through time and make a significant change, their actions will cause that timeline to branch off into an alternate timeline. Like in part four of Legion Quest, when Legion went back in time in an attempt to kill Magneto, only to accidentally kill his father Charles, who gave his life to save his friend, which changed a number of events going forward, creating the Age of Apocalypse. And if I remember correctly, back then, this replaced the main Marvel Universe, but not long after it was retconned to make the Age of Apocalypse its own universe, where it was given the Earth designation 295 instead. And over the course of time, Jonathan Hickman came in and laid the groundwork, as far as one timeline branching off into another and the consequences that could follow. But in addition, we also had the concept of Genesis Point that reintroduced the idea 
of a point in time if where changes are made, then those changes will take hold from that point moving forward, rewriting the future of that universe, which is what we saw happen a number of times throughout Avengers Forever Volume 2, where we saw a number of variants whose world had been taken by the multiversal masters of evil, like Earth 818 for example, which was supposed to flourish into one of the most beautiful worlds in the multiverse. It didn't branch off into a new designation. But instead, because the Masters of Evil changed its history from the Genesis point, they were able to change Earth-818 into the Wastelands, without branching a new timeline and still keeping it as Earth-818. But jumping back in, I just wanted you guys to know, or really just reiterate the whole Genesis point thing, because that's what Jason Aaron's using to sell the whole gravity of this fight that's happening here which is a fight that we've been building up to for quite some time. And funny enough, this is just the beginning with it heading into the huge multiversal war. But during this time, while the different heroes are fighting off the multiversal masters of evil, we're also given this moment where Brandy Selby makes her way over to the star brand to pay her respects. Since he was one of the first of many who came before her, she thanks him for giving his life so that she might live. And given her unique condition, where using so much of her powers caused her to age rapidly, she just wishes that she had the strength to continue and possibly do the same that he did. And going forward, the concept of sacrifice, it's something that kind of just echoes throughout this battle. Cause with Agamotto losing his eyes and the star brand losing his life, for the Avengers 1 million BC, for them, this is in addition to the death of the Black Panther. And of all the Avengers 1 million BC who are here, we find that a lot of this weighs heavy on the Ghost Rider. And that's something we'll talk more about in a little bit. But right now, while Nighthawk is fighting the Ghost Goblin, the Ghost Rider steps in, saving Nighthawk with little to no effort. And we get this moment here where Nighthawk is kind of like, oh my god, this is Norman Osborn. And he asks Norman, what did he do to get this kind of power? So the Ghost Rider answers Nighthawk, letting him know that Norman did what his kind always does. He sold his soul for sin. And Norman responds to the Ghost Rider, telling him, yeah, just like you. But the Ghost Rider, he begs to differ. And he tells Norman that he is the first of the Riders, the first light to the Flames of Wrath. He is vengeance everlasting, while Norman, the Ghost Goblin, is just bones and skin. And this is something that partially has to do with what Avenger Prime mentioned about Earth-616 being different, but it's also a bit of a callback to what we talked about when I covered the origin of the prehistoric Ghost Rider, as well as the history of the spirit of vengeance itself, with it originating as God's wrath given to man, who were manipulated by Zarathos, who was tricked and captured by Mephisto. And I have that link down below for the extended version of that explanation. For anyone who's new here or may have missed it. But right now with the two of these guys going head to head, the Ghost Rider just overpowers the Ghost Goblin, shutting him down completely, only to then finish him shortly after. And with seeing this, Nighthawk reminds the Ghost Rider that they're both the child of Mephisto, which for Nighthawk is referencing what we saw in Heroes Reborn. But he tells the Ghost Rider in spite of this, they need to remember that they have to be better than him. They have to be better than Mephisto to win this. But the Ghost Rider tells Nighthawk that he's wrong. Cause if they want to win this, they have to be a lot worse. Cause the Ghost Rider, he's not doing this out of emotion. He's thought about this for some time. And now with the Ghost Goblin dead, the Dark Phoenix looks to the Doom above all, and she's more or less like, is it me? Or is this Earth taking a lot longer than usual to subdue? Because the agreement before was that Mephisto was supposed to take care of the Avengers who made it here from the future. But as soon as he got what he wanted, he took off to Infinity's End, leaving the Masters of Evil to take on two teams at once. So the Doom above all comes up with a solution to correct that by taking advantage of the Genesis point and conjuring up a mystical plague to kill the primitive ancestors of the heroes who are here. Cause if the ancestors of Steve Rogers, Jane Foster, or Maya Lopez die here, then they will have never been born. So thinking and acting quickly, Jane and the Ghost Rider both head out to try and stop it, while also trying to figure out the how part in the process, and the Ghost Rider notices that he's able to burn some of it away, which quickly answers the question of how. But the Doom above all has this plague spreading at such an unnatural speed that the Rider's not able to reach every corner before the plague is spread too far. So to help Jane, she tries to move some of the primitives, and she even tries using the all weapon as a gas mask, but she can only get to so many. And it's here where the Ghost Rider asks Jane, the same question he had asked Agamotto not too long ago, when he found him defeated and freezing just after losing his fight with Mephisto. He asked Agamotto since he can see the future, if sin will ever end. Where at the time, Agamotto told him no, it's definitely not gonna end. Cause the more humankind grows and spreads, the more new ways they'll devise to slay and defile one another. Which of course wasn't the answer that the writer wanted to hear, cause he was hoping that one day, the work he had done as a ghost writer would eventually purge the world of sin. 
And if you guys remember, just after that, he asked Agamotto, why is he doing this? Because the writer wanted to know why is he fighting this war that they'll never win, which at the time, Agamotto just didn't have an answer for that. So now with him talking to Jane, who's from the future, he asks her if it's worth it, if the fight that they're fighting now is even worth saving the people who aren't here yet. And she tells him, despite the evidence to the contrary, with every fiber of her being, yes, it's worth all of that and more. So the writer more or less just lets her know that he heard what he needed to hear as he races into the plague behind the primitives while saying one last goodbye to his mammoth as he gives the ultimate sacrifice to save the primitives as well as the future of humanity which is a pretty crazy ending to the ghost rider's story which i don't believe is an absolute ending because we've seen other issues where he's reappeared in the present day so minor spoilers there but right now this fight still isn't over even with both sides taking significant losses, the battle continues because the future of Earth-616 is still on the line. And as the fight continues, we then discover that the prehistoric avatar of the Phoenix is making her way back to Earth with her hearing thunder from worlds away, letting her know that she's got to protect the world that she once fought to save, a world that she loves dearly, as well as her son Thor, who, I don't know, is more of a godson, I guess now that we know the real story behind the phoenix being one of thor's mothers <laughs> but nonetheless she's coming back and she's ready to return to the fight all right so jumping back in we continue at the avengers tower at infinity's end which is packed with mephistos as far as the eye can see because now just like how 616 mephisto had shown avenger prime after he left the tower and got captured the next step for the other mephistos is to take over infinity tower so now Mephisto and his council, they've got countless variants from across the multiverse charging towards Infinity Tower so that they can begin their own new multiversal order. But while these variants are charging in, the All Riders Hell Charger just comes swooping down, running over a number of these Mephistos on the way in. But as you might notice, there's not much of any flames going on here, which at first may seem like Robbie's trying to save it for a more dramatic moment. But instead, when they get here and Earth-818 Tony Stark is trying to tell Robbie that this would be a great time for the All Rider to start All Riding, Robbie just tells him for some reason he can't become the Ghost Rider. So from here, instead of them trying to take on these Mephistos, they move their focus to just getting inside of Avengers Tower alive. And going back to the army of Mephistos, who now are just a few steps away from reaching Avengers Tower, as they get closer, we also see there are some shadowy figures in the trenches just outside, who now have been given the green light to engage. And as it turns out, it's the multiversal Howling Commandos, which now brings back a whole lot of caps that we ain't seen in a long time, either from earlier in this story or others. But just as a reminder, with everything that we saw leading up to this, as far as Earth-818 Tony Stark, the Deathlock, and Robbie Reyes recruiting heroes from across the multiverse to protect the Avengers Tower at Infinity's End, this is what they were called here for. And just as a reminder, it's the location of the God Quarry that's more important than the Avenger Tower or the Watchtower itself. And in a little bit, I'll go over the reason why. For anyone who's new or not familiar with the God Quarry, but for right now, with all these different Steve Rogers holding the line, out front, leading the defenses, it isn't too long before a number of other Mephistos take to the skies and start raining down fire on all the Captain Americas, which is a bit too much for these guys to handle. So of course, to come to their aid and handle the airborne Mephistos, next up, we got the Carol Corps, sending out all their fighters from the Omni Carrier, which like we saw in Avengers Forever issue 9, the Carol Corps has been ready and waiting for this. But what they weren't ready for was a huge Pacific Rim sized Mephisto who just charges at the Omni Carrier and just manhandles it, swatting down planes and ships all along the way, which now has me thinking like it would have been wild to have seen a Pacific Rim version of Carol Danvers or a Carol and Steve combo. That would have been wild because we crossed the line of going over the top a long time ago. But soon after this huge Mephisto is then approached by Thor the god of fists who you guys know i like to call one punch thor but he doesn't waste much of any time getting in here and getting to it because he takes down this mephisto quick fast and in a hurry only for other super huge mephistos to then come stomping in which now has the heroes calling for their special ops omega squad which is the star panther as he flies through the heads of multiple giant Mephistos with a very Superman-esque type of entrance. Cause I'm sure some would say it's like Captain Marvel in Avengers Endgame, which yeah, I could see that. But for me, it's feeling more like a Superman scene with the Mephisto had his chance type of vibe with the eye beams or perhaps even something out of Invincible, more so than a Captain Marvel kind of thing. 
And next, when we go inside of Avengers Tower, we find that Earth 818 Tony Stark and Robbie Reyes made their way in. And now, Tony, he's ready to meet this Avenger Prime that the Deathlock had told him so much about. But as we know from the events leading into this, Avenger Prime has been taken by Earth 616 Mephisto. But while Tony's here, he's finally reunited with both the Vision and the Moon Knight from his world, Earth 818 who are two familiar faces that he hasn't seen in a long time. And as they're catching up, we also get this moment where they're just like, hey, what's, what's wrong with Robbie? Who's just sulking over on the side by his charger? So Tony fills them in about what happened back in their last run-in with the Masters of Evil, when Robbie nearly burnt himself out trying to take them on, which at the time was unfortunately the last moments for the Deathlock who had brought them so far. And now for Tony, since he recently quit drinking, he figured that he might as well get back into the fight. And as it turns out, everything he needs to do that, it's right here at Avengers Tower. So he borrows, air quotes, some ants in the gear that he needs, with the Ant-Man department being adjacent to the Iron Man and Vision department. And it's a little funny how the Winter Soldier stuff looks like it's kind of in the info section, right in between. Not sure if that was really intentional or not, who knows. But now with Tony having everything that he needs, he lets Moon Knight and his vision know that he's got a plan, which now takes them digging to make their way out under the battlefield so they can get under the Mephisto's main position and take their leadership by surprise. And of course, this whole tactic of shrinking down and crawling under everybody, it's got Moon Knight and Vision a bit nervous because more often than not, Tony's plans have them shrinking down to a size that's more vulnerable to the attack that they're already under. And now it's got them thinking like, who's to say that somebody up top ain't just gonna bust a hole in the ground and obliterate these guys in transit? Which, I mean, it's a very logical argument. But while they're making their way under the battlefield, they hear a ton of noise, but it's not coming from up top. And as they go in further, they find out the Mephistos are digging directly down into the bedrock to access the universe of ancient energy that lies beneath. Which really means that the fight up top won't mean anything if these Mephistos succeed at making their way through the bedrock. This whole thing is over. Because like we talked about before, the Avenger Prime's Watchtower, which is often called the Avengers Tower at Infinity's End. And it's not like that's a shorter name or it rolls off the tongue better. That's just what it is. And really, you could just chalk it up to one of those situations where the location's just so old, it's got a lot of different names. But nonetheless, that's not the important part. The important thing about the Watchtower is what it's watching with it being located at the Quarry of Creation, which in more recent years has been referred to as the God Quarry. Which again, is more of that old places, plenty of names kind of thing going on, with the God Quarry becoming a name that it was given when it started to become a graveyard for gods. But way underneath the bedrock, which is nigh impenetrable, lies the boundary between all creations, including the first firmament, which is the original cosmos that was once eternal and unchanging until the Celestials shattered it and created the first multiverse. So now if Mephisto gets access to this, then him and his council will be able to reshape the multiverse in their image, which now causes a very quick change of plans for Tony and the others. And without much thought to it, they just dive in and get to fighting. And as soon as they do, we get this wild moment where Moon Knight asks Tony if he's still drunk because this plan or lack of a plan for that matter, it's pretty crazy. And one of these Mephistos, who's like a, a multi-armed bartender Mephisto, I guess, I don't know. He's just like, did someone say they could use a drink? And this Mephisto just grabs Tony and he starts just pouring all kind of whiskey and liquor in Tony face while other Mephistos are just saying, you can have all the drinks you want, just stand down. And the other's like, just betray the others, Tony, and sign your soul over to me. And it just has me thinking, like, in what universe is there a Mephisto that has people selling their soul not to become a Ghost Rider, but for a drink? And you know, when I say it out loud, I'm, I'm thinking it's probably the universe that we living in right now. Yeah, I don't know. But nonetheless, all of this is really just a distraction for one of them to attack Tony from behind. So Moon Knight tells Vision to get Tony out of there, but Vision's like, no, because he's not leaving them behind. And it's kind of messed up for a moment because the Moon Knight, she tells Vision that they got to save Tony. He's a pillar. They need him to win the war. While on the other hand, for her, she's just a fist of Khonshu. She's expendable. And though it would be a shame for her to die down here so far away from the moonlight, she's ready to do what needs to be done. But all of a sudden, fire comes pouring down and taking out these Mephistos as a voice from above says, hey, down there. What are you boys doing hiding down below when there's a party up top? And it's here where Tony, Vision, and Moon Knight look up and they see old man Phoenix fully reassembled and making his way to the fight as he's accompanied by the goddesses of thunder, 
who we know from earlier issues are the ones who found the pieces of Old Man Phoenix and put him back together, which is another story that we'll explore a bit more really soon. And when we do, we will finally get the question answered of how the Dark Phoenix, who is with the multiversal masters of evil, came to be. All right, so for this one, we jump from Infinity's End and return back to Earth in the prehistoric era, where the fight continues between the Avengers and the multiversal masters of evil. And as this starts, we get this narration from Tony Stark, with him talking about how over multiple millions of years, there's been five mass extinction events, and how the fight they're fighting right now could be number six. But also, he says that his armor's internal clock is telling him that this fight has been going for nine days straight, which for him feels like months, because he hasn't had any sleep, but he was knocked out unconscious a couple times, which I guess is the next best thing. But as we dive back into the fight, we get this moment where Tony goes for King Killmonger, prying open his helmet so that Thor, Captain Marvel, and Odin can go for the head. Because otherwise, King Killmonger's Asgardian and Wakandan hybrid destroyer armor is showing no signs of taking damage. So at this point, <laughs> nine days later, they figure it's face time. And this method proves to be very effective, with King Killmonger taking a ton of damage from the inside out. But even still, he begins to recover at an insane rate. So it's here where the Iron Fist steps in with the cameo brutality, making good use of this opportunity that was made by Tony and the others to light up the weakened King Killmonger faster than he could recover. And at the same time, he kind of messed up too because he didn't think that the Iron Fist was going to do much of anything. And if he were at full strength, perhaps not. But she caught him lacking severely. And now he's out here leaking. And just after this, in a moment of downtime, Tony hears a familiar voice calling his name, coming from a nearby cave. So he rushes in to see what it is, without mentioning to the others that he's stepping off to do a side mission. But eventually in this cave, Tony finds the empty armor of the Iron Inquisitor, where out from behind it, the creator of this armor, and the Iron Inquisitor himself, Earth-4111 Howard Stark, comes out with his hands up, telling Tony that it's him, his father. And right off the bat, Tony's skeptical for obvious reasons. And not just because he knows that his father's dead, but also because a while back, Mephisto played this trick on him, where he told Tony that his father sold him, sold Tony to Mephisto, which is something that I want to talk a little bit more about in just a moment. But again, Tony has his doubts, and he thinks that this is just another one of Mephisto's cheap tricks. But this Howard Stark, the Iron Inquisitor, he's initially up front with Tony, and he tells him that he is indeed a Howard from another Earth, which means that their blood is still the same. But when this Howard lets Tony know that he had made a deal with Mephisto back on his Earth that bound his soul, which is also true, but he fails to mention that the deal required him to kill his own son, the Tony Stark of Earth 4111, and he ends up twisting the story around by telling Tony that Mephisto wanted him to kill him. But instead, Howard tells Tony that he wants him to join him so that the future can be reshaped by them, and all Tony has to do is take his hand. But Tony refuses by popping the old man with a repulsor blast, with Tony more or less telling the Inquisitor that he must have thought that this was gonna go something like Star Wars, where he would just pop up and be like, join me, Luke, and together we'll bring order to the galaxy, <laughs> which is very much what it felt like. But the Inquisitor lets Tony know that not only was the offer real, but it was also Mephisto's idea to try to wheel Tony in. So he hits Tony with an EMP, rendering his armor useless, and from there, the two of them just duke it out. But from here, I also want to mention something that's kind of been brushed over up to this point. Because I think it's one of the most important details for this whole series. Because at the time when Mephisto played his quote-unquote trick on Tony Stark, when we got the story The Last Temptation of Tony Stark, Iron Man, at the end of that story, we got a conversation between the Iron Inquisitor and Mephisto, where this same Howard Stark told Mephisto that he knew 616 Tony wouldn't give in. And at that time, Mephisto told the Iron Inquisitor that he knew Tony wouldn't make a deal, but he did this so that he can sow doubt within Tony Stark that will ripple outward through the pink membranes that separate the worlds and all the Tony Starks would feel it, whether they knew it or not, which is really the answer to the question about Earth 616 and why it's so important, because the things that happen on Earth 616 echo throughout the multiverse, making variants an easier target with them inheriting the doubt or the addictions amongst a number of other traits that originate from their Earth 616 counterpart, which is also the reason why Mephisto told the Doom Above All that he wanted to save Earth 616 for last. But going back to the fight, it's here where the Black Skull says that he's no longer holding back 
and he's going to let the symbiote take full control, which causes him to turn into a more Venom-like version of the Black Skull. But the Black Skull's moment of glory is cut short when Captain America picks up his blistering hot shield and takes him down, followed by Agamotto using the fiery bands of Malagoom to hold him. But it doesn't end here, cause the symbiote just ends up leaving him, only to then make its way over to Kid Thanos, as he then transforms into symbiote Kid Thanos with him taking on a more adult form, kind of like what we've seen with Dylan and Bren in the Venom series, almost like these symbiote kids just can't wait to grow up, cause as soon as they get a symbiote, they're grown. But nonetheless, symbiote kid Thanos, he's a problem, and it eventually takes nearly everybody to fight him. Meanwhile inside the cave, Tony's fighting his father from another reality for the fate of human history. And deep down inside, Tony knew that it would all come down to this someday. And with Tony saying this and not being serious, just being Tony, the Inquisitor tells him that this has really come down to Iron Man being soft, which right there just sets off something in Tony and he goes off, gaining the upper hand, balling it up and dropping it right down on his daddy's head. And at the same time, we also got Jane and Maya Lopez going up against the Dark Phoenix, with Maya telling Jane not to hold anything back because the Dark Phoenix is powerful enough to scorch the earth that she wanted to. And for a moment here with both Jane and Maya getting knocked back, we get a moment of some connecting tissue that Jason Aaron's throwing in here, with us seeing the other Avengers from across time that the modern day Avengers met on their way to 1 million BC, with some heroes in the future and some even further in the past, sensing Maya at the Genesis point. So they send her help back through that passage so that she can hit the Dark Phoenix hard. And I mean, this is one of those parts where I'm like, okay, like this little piece right here, we could have did without this. Cause I know we got the whole Genesis point thing going on and I'm sure Jason Aaron wanted to tie back in the other Avengers that showed up throughout the series from their different time periods. But I mean, I just feel like somebody should have just said, nah, there's enough going on, man. Just leave that out. But nonetheless, we're gonna roll with it cause it's also building up to the reveal of the Dark Phoenix and her true identity which will tell us why we got two of them running around right now. But as Maya Lopez is charging up, you got Namor and Captain Marvel pulling the symbiote off of Kid Thanos, while Odin and Thor use their hammers to pin it down. And way in the back, you got Captain America, who's like, we need fire, somebody, burn it off Thanos, give it all you got. So Lopez lets it rip, and that's it for symbiote Kid Thanos. But during all the commotion, he still managed to slip away. And there's also no sign of the Dark Phoenix. But as Iron Man comes limping towards them, he tells everyone they should spread out cause she couldn't have gotten far. And Cap's like, you heard Tony, standard search pattern. But then off to the side, Tony starts to shape shift while saying, cannot stop now. I've carried this fire so long, killed so many in his name. No, in my name, the fires of mystique will outburn them all. And right there, Captain America's like, well, new plan everybody, find Tony Stark. Cause when we go back to Tony inside the cave, we find that he's defeated the Iron Inquisitor. He's got his armor back up and working as he goes on to destroy the Iron Inquisitor's armor to keep him from suiting up again. And for a moment, this Howard tries to tell Tony that he doesn't have the guts to do the things that this Howard did to him. So Tony just lets him know that it's murderers like him who claim that it takes courage to be them. But there's nothing brave about being a piece of garbage. And next, Tony finally takes Howard's hand. He takes both of them and he crushes them so that Howard won't rebuild this suit after Tony leaves him here in this cave to die. And as Tony leaves, Earth 4111 Howard Stark is just screaming for Tony to come back and finish him off, but Tony just keeps on going. And when we go back over to Mystique, we find that she's chased down the doom above all to give him a piece of her mind since the masters of evil are getting destroyed and he's doing nothing. But when she goes over to him, she finds out that he's not even there anymore. And in fact, for him, he was just using this fight as a distraction. Cause right now he's back at his castle, which is located on Doom the Living Planet. His troops are assembled and they are but moments away from their target, which is located at Infinity's End. All right, so recently with us getting the return of Old Man Phoenix at Infinity's End, his surprise return left us with quite a bit of catching up to do. Cause we knew eventually that he was gonna show up, but the story of how he was dismembered and scattered in every direction, that part has been a mystery since Avengers Forever issue four. And it's a mystery that's been lingering until now. Cause we find out eons in the future where he came from. Old Man Phoenix was paid a visit by someone who's been a friend and a foe. 
of his for billions of years. And when we find him here suffering from multiple shots that came from a very special weapon that we'll talk more about in a little bit, we see him speaking to the shooter, telling her that they've done this song and dance so many times over the years that he can't even remember when they first met. But she tells him that she remembers, she remembers everything as we look up and discover that it's Mystique who first reminds Old Man Phoenix about when they first met in Mexico 1921, which is a callback to Wolverine issue 62, which was also written by Jason Aaron. And she reminds him of how the two of them were tied to a post facing a firing squad, but I can't help that every time I think of this issue, there's a few moments of dialogue that just had me like, really Jason Aaron? Like how they were blindfolded and Logan's asking why she's here? And Mystique was like, I was born with the wrong color skin. And Logan was like, you're black? Which was a conversation that would pop up on the internet through Reddit threads and Twitter time and time again. But if we're honest, that's one of many wild moments in that issue, let alone that series that had people looking at Logan a little crazy. But nonetheless, in the far future, Mystique tells Old Man Phoenix that she's hated him because they're so much alike. Cause somehow the world would always serve him lemonade and leave her holding the lemons. But now he doesn't have to worry about them doing this dance anymore. Cause after this, they'll never have to kill each other again. And with Mystique saying this, she shoots old man Phoenix another time with the Phoenix gun, which is yet another Jason Aaron callback to himself. With the Phoenix gun originally appearing in Astonishing Spider-Man and Wolverine issue two back in 2010. With it being a gun that was created by Beast that can fire single rounds of the Phoenix Force. And at the time we were told that whoever fired this weapon would be completely destroyed as well, with the bullets being powerful enough to completely blow up a planet. Which was why at the time when we saw Spider-Man getting ready to use it, Logan knocked him out and took it from him, while saying that it ought to be him squeezing the trigger. But since then the Phoenix gun itself has been destroyed. And much like how, now, we're dealing with a different Doom the Living Planet amongst a number of other variants who we've seen killed in previous stories. My guess is the Phoenix gun that Mystique is using is likely an alternate version that has also harvested the power of the one and only Phoenix. And that's just my guess because Jason Aaron doesn't spend too much time explaining every little detail here because we're just giving a recap of what really could have been its own standalone tie-in issue. But as we're told here with narration that's given by Elsif, one of the granddaughters of old King Thor, it was here in a place beyond the far shore, beyond the confines of space and time, where a new phoenix rose from the blood of the old and turned the white hot room red. That Mystique sent Logan's parts and pieces flying in every direction, like a hail of blood spewing comets. And with Raven taking the phoenix force from old man phoenix, this began her journey as the dark phoenix. But in the far future, with the pieces and parts of Logan flying everywhere, one of these pieces flew all the way into Avengers Forever issue 4, landing in New Midgard, nearby the Goddesses of Thunder, where at this time, with the help of Mjolnir, they went on a search for the other pieces of Old Man Phoenix, which sent them on their own adventure. But most of what happened with them along the way, it's not covered in this event. And I guess it's because this event is busy enough as is, so for that reason, it makes sense. But along their way, gathering the many parts and pieces of Old Man Phoenix, they collected different millionaires from across the multiverse that were each left abandoned by fallen Thors. But as the sisters went along their way collecting these pieces, some were easier to collect than others. Like for example, the right hand that just landed in New Midgard, that was easy. Logan's head, not so much with them finding it in the possession of a Mangog who didn't want to let it go. But nonetheless, the sisters found every last piece and part, allowing them to stitch Old Man Phoenix back together. And as soon as this was done, Logan told them that they needed to make their way to the God Quarry at Infinity's End, which from here is what connects their story with what we saw in Avengers Forever issue 12. And come to find out their arrival to this battle, it turns the tables in a huge way. And not only because they're bringing a Phoenix Wolverine to the fight, cause I mean, don't take me wrong, the guy's no slouch. But in addition to him parting Mephistos like the Red Sea, the Goddesses of Thunder followed this up by unleashing all the hammers that they'd found from across the multiverse, causing it to rain down millionaires with each and every one of these hammers seeking out a Mephisto. And when this happens, I just think it's kind of funny that one of these hammers just happens to have an Xbox looking logo on top of it, like they thought nobody was going to notice, but we did. But nonetheless, after the hammers come down, most of the Mephistos are taken out, with the exception of the few remaining who just fled. And at first, Thor, the god of fists, he's like, well, we need to go after them and make sure that we hunt down every last one. But one of the Carol Danvers let him know that it could be a trap, 
and that they probably should stay close to the tower, at least until they hear from Avenger Prime. And Old Man Phoenix lets them know that it's not so much the tower that's important here, but instead it's the God Quarry, the bedrock of everything that is, which is what the Mephistos were truly after, because the tower is just what's protecting the quarry. So from here, Earth-818 Tony Stark tells the others what him, Vision, and Moon Knight saw as far as the Mephistos mining and digging their way deeper into the quarry. So he tells Captain Carter to take a few Steves and go check it out. And as they make their way, Old Man Phoenix is looking at Weapon America. Like, really? Because the whole concept, it, it is ridiculous. But Weapon America just tells him, look who's talking. Because Phoenix Wolverine? Yeah. And also, Thor, the God of Fists, he meets the Carol Danvers, who jumped out of the pit. And you can tell the two of them are kind of having an awkward moment introducing themselves. Because it's like, well, what do you do? Well, I jumped out of a pit. Well, what do you do? I punched my hammer. And it's kind of like, yeah, without the context, it sounds a bit underwhelming. But just after this, Robbie Reyes, he radios out to the heroes from the tower, telling them that all sorts of alarms up there are going crazy. And right away, just outside, a huge shadow casts over all the heroes as Tony tells Robbie to get out of there now, as they look up and see the arrival of Doom the Living Planet crashing into the Avengers Tower, which now this cranks up the stakes a lot higher than what it was before. Cause now the Doom above all, Doom Supreme is here with an army of dooms that these guys got to go up against, which is a lot different than fighting against a bunch of Mephistos who weren't as powerful as they would have been in their own realm. Cause with Doom Supreme here, he's a powerful sorcerer and that's something that the heroes are lacking sorely on their end. And they see this right away when Star Panther and Old Man Phoenix go after Doom Supreme as he whips up a spell. Cause they're not even able to touch him with him being protected in his magic barrier that neither one of them can get through. And Old Man Phoenix calls us out. He tells them we're dealing with a Sorcerer Supreme and we're gonna need a wizard of our own to get through this. And I mean, he's not wrong. But now with the Mephistos gone, we see the return of Avenger Prime who was previously occupied with the task of nearly dying at the hand of some Mephistos. And when he gets here, this is the big reveal I was telling you guys about, the one that we already knew the answer to. Cause when he shows up, 818 Tony is like, oh, so this is Avenger Prime. And Avenger Prime is like, yes indeed, Tony Stark. For in all the many universes, one thing is always constant. You cannot have the Avengers without a Loki to bring them together. As Elsif just looks at him and says, oh, hell no. <laughs> But now that we've got this reveal, after this we get into the origin of Avenger Prime, which then brings us back to more of the fight that leads us right into the conclusion. So stay tuned because it's only going to get crazier. Alright, so with us getting the reveal of Avenger Prime in Avengers Forever issue 13, where we discovered that he was Loki this whole time. Like I'd mentioned before, the reveal itself wasn't much of a surprise, to me at least. And from what I could tell in the comments, a lot of you guys felt the same. But I also believe that the effect or reaction that was expected for the reveal, it's more so deserved for the story of how he became Avenger Prime than the reveal itself. And for you guys who have been following along, you either already know or you're about to see what I mean. But it's from here where Avenger Prime tells his story and he starts with his childhood on a day that he would consider at the time to be the happiest day of his life with it being the day that his brother Thor died which is something that Avenger Prime feels a deep shame of admitting that he'd felt that way but every time he begins this story he has to start here if he's gonna be completely honest and to be clear at the time young Loki had nothing to do with Thor's death but instead when Prince Thor attempted to tame Mjolnir he was pulled by the hammer into the sun only for it to return with his fist clenched around it and nothing else left of him which was a tragedy that took its toll on Odin he was never the same from that day which then allowed Loki to supplant him as Allfather at a relatively young age to where from there Loki sold Odin as a slave to the frost giants of Jotunheim which at the time he believed that this was going to be the second happiest day of his life but it wasn't and now alone in his throne room Allfather Loki began to wonder, with him being the greatest of all the gods in the Ten Realms, why did he feel so empty? So with time, he ventured out to seek the answer to this question by seeking counsel from the only person he could bring himself to respect, which of course, was himself. But even with Loki combining his power as the Allfather with his magic, 
to scale the walls between universes, every variant Loki that he would encounter and make an acquaintance with would eventually betray him, which caused Loki to realize, or at the least believe, if there is a constant throughout the multiverse, it's that a Loki cannot be trusted. So after many attempts, Loki pondered one evening, and after disposing of the remains of one of his alternate selves, he asked the question, why are Lokis such despicable creatures? And with them posing this new question, he ended up changing his tactic, which led him to exploring the multiverse to observe other Lokis in secret to learn more, only to find that all these other Lokis always lost, and he was just an anomaly amongst them with him gracing the throne of Asgard and becoming the most powerful sorcerer in his reality. But he also noticed on these other Earths, where his variants would always fall, that it would happen at the hand of the Avengers, who at the time he saw as mostly humans pretending to be gods. But in universe after universe, Earth's mightiest heroes would inevitably find themselves first drawn together to face a version of him. And he acknowledges that these different worlds had versions of this sort of gathering in their cave dwelling days, but when they assembled because of a Loki, those Avengers would lead the way into an age of heroes that would never go away. So then he was like, okay, simple solution, no more Avengers, which once again led him on a journey to becoming the victim of his own success. Cause right away he went back to his own world and he made provisions to make sure that no new Thunder God would ever come to power. He made sure to find Captain America in the ice first, only to then drop him off in Jotunheim. He made sure that Tony Stark would never forge his first suit of armor. He sacked Wakanda, slaughtered every half-breed Kree, transported the Ghost Riders to Muspelheim. Loki covered all his bases. He obliterated anybody in the world who might someday feel the urge to avenge. But after gazing upon his victory and the work that he put in, making his world completely devoid of Avengers, a world where he stood as the sole guardian and protector. It was here where he realized that he had only done what all Lokis do, and that was just find a new way to lose. Cause the whole time that he was in a rush to get rid of the Avengers, Loki had easily forgotten that he wasn't the only reason why the Avengers would assemble. And with the Avengers gone, soon after, Allfather Loki was met by Galactus, the Celestials, Thanos, the Red Skull, Gore the God Butcher, with each of them having a different vision for this universe, and Allfather Loki standing alone to face them all. And he bodied them, which he admits was a feat that pushed his sorcery to levels beyond anything he had imagined. But all magic comes with a price. So for a victory of this magnitude, the cost was nothing less than every living being in his universe, which I'll admit it kind of got me like, man, I want to see that. And not just the aftermath, but I mean, take your time. I want to see the fight. And hopefully someday someone will be able to fill us in on how exactly this went down. But at this point, not only did Loki set himself up to be a victim of his own success, with him now being an all father with no subjects, but in another moment of honesty, with him telling this story, he admits that he believed that this would also be the second happiest day of his life, but he didn't feel the slightest flicker of joy. So he decided to throw himself into the sun to end himself, only to find that in this brief moment, he would be just like the other Lokis and fail. Because instead of waking up in the icy plains of hell, he slipped through the cracks between universes, only to open his eyes and realize that he had arrived at the God Quarry located at Infinity's End, which like we'd seen before in Thanos Wins, as well as a number of times throughout this series, and the free comic book day teaser for this event. The God Quarry is a place of great power that has drawn gods to it like moths to a flame, which in a lot of ways it's similar to the Source Wall in DC Comics, at least before that was destroyed over there. But nonetheless, with Loki arriving here in what he would call a forest of fossilized remains that stretched into forever, for him at the time, he believed that he belonged among them. And with them coming here, he just went for what he thought was the natural next step, which was for him to do what no other Loki had ever done. And that was pray that he would be fossilized as well and join them, which was a prayer that was answered, but not quite in the way that he had expected. Cause the answer was no, they would not allow him to die without serving his penance. And because the multiverse has shown that Lokis were always fated to be the force that brought the Avengers together, all father Loki, the greatest Loki in all of the multiverse would be sentenced to assemble the mightiest Avengers in all of infinity. And here we're also shown when this happened, all father Loki being converted into Avenger prime, as well as the construction of the Avenger tower, 
that had only been mentioned in the 2021 free comic book day Avengers and Hulk issue, which at the time was very cryptic about how the Avengers Tower at Infinity's End had came to be, as well as who Avenger Prime was. But I'll admit, when it mentioned how it took many Starks and Thors and Visions many days to build this tower, I was hoping when the time came and we got this actual story, that it would have taken its time and given these Iron Men and these Visions and Thors a bit more of a backstory instead of kind of just brushing through here. But again, it seems a lot like the emphasis was more so on the surprise of who Avenger Prime was going to be, more so than the additional details and information that we got at the time. But like I said before, the story is jam-packed as it is, so I get it. And for Avenger Prime, with him getting to this portion of the story, he talks about the other heroes who he's assembled and how he had confessed to them his crimes. And in response, some of them wanted him dead. Others wanted him to serve an eternal sentence in this tower. But amongst the other Avengers who came and left over the eons, Avenger Prime found the Deathlocks to be the most trusted soldiers, which is why he decided to send them in the Death Hunter series, which we covered many moons ago, and I got that link below. But with Avenger Prime operating from the shadows for eons, it wasn't until recently when he found that he needed to make contact with the Avengers of Earth-616, with him hoping along the way that Earth-616 Thor could take a joke. But nonetheless, that story leads everything back here to Avengers Assemble, where now with Doom the Living Planet destroying the Avengers Tower and the Doom Above All's army rushing in, it's time for the Avenger Prime to show some of that power he was talking about during story time. And he doesn't disappoint, because as this wave of dooms come rushing in, screaming death to all the Avengers, death and fire and ruin, in the name of Doom, Avenger Prime just tells them that that name has no power here, as he calls for the winds of a tomb from four different universes to strike these dooms, leaving nothing but bones in their wake. Which for a moment has 818 Tony Stark like, wait a minute, we sure he a good guy? And Avenger Prime lets them know that Doom's army is much larger than that. But this has at least bought them a moment. But Thor's granddaughter Frigg just tells him that, hey, we gonna need a little bit more than that. Because Avenger Prime even said it himself, no Loki can be trusted. So it makes sense that they would have a few more questions for him. But before he can continue, he's struck with pain with a knife emerging from his back. So he pulls it out and he's like, oh yeah, about that. And he tells them how not too long ago, he traveled to Earth 616 in an attempt to help those Avengers protect their Genesis point, only for him to get attacked by a horde of Mephistos, which is something we partially saw in Avengers Assemble Alpha. And here we're given a glimpse at how Avenger Prime got himself out of that, with it being hinted that he slaughtered a ton of these Mephistos with Green Thunder which once again, I'll say would have been nice to see. But even with him sharing these details, many of the heroes are still skeptical, which makes sense, especially for Thor's granddaughters. After seeing their father, old King Thor, wrestle with his brother at the end of time, yearning for his brother's redemption. So Avenger Prime tells Elsa, when there are thunderers involved, he finds it helps to bring gifts. So he has. And as the next wave of dooms come rushing in, Avenger Prime opens up a portal, bringing in the modern day Avengers from Earth 616, as well as the Avengers 1 million BC, so that they can now join the fight at Infinity's End, as Avenger Prime continues to prove his loyalty. Alright, so coming back from our last talk on the multiversal war for Infinity's End, after we got the reveal of Avenger Prime being Loki, which nobody was surprised to see, we then got that insane origin story of how he became the most powerful Loki in the multiverse, and how that path led to him becoming Avenger Prime as well as the Guardian of the God Quarry. And now with us knowing who Avenger Prime truly is, we see him bring the heroes from Earth 616 to the God Quarry to join the fight. And when you think about it from here going forward, this is the moment where all the storylines we've been covering come together. From our talks on the 2018 Avengers run, which was split between your modern day Avengers and the Avengers 1 million BC, to our talks on Avengers Forever, which took us all across the multiverse and back. So there's been quite the build up to assemble as many heroes as possible, which all started with Avenger Prime sending out the Death Hunters. So it's only right that he brings everyone together to Ground Zero at Infinity's End. Because if the Doom above all and his army of dooms take it, he'll be able to rewrite all of reality however he likes. 
which is the reason why there's so many heroes here. But even with the heroes of Earth 616, stepping through the portal and pulling off this on your left moment, it doesn't shift the needle as far as to the point where you just have the multiversal Avengers running over Doom Supreme's army. Because at the end of the day, these aren't Doom bots. They're all Dooms from across the multiverse, with each one of them being a sorcerer in their own right. So even when there's a moment when the Dooms are outnumbered, they're still taking out enough of the multiversal Avengers to even the playing field. Which again, like we saw before, this isn't exactly what the heroes were prepared for. Because this attack from the Doom above all in his army, it's something that he'd been working on. Behind Mephisto's back, as well as behind the back of his own team, the Multiversal Masters of Evil. At least during the time that they were still a thing. But right now, with the Doom above all being the most powerful of all of these Dooms, he's taking on both Avenger Prime and the Phoenix Wolverine, while the heroes of Earth 616 continue to help the other Avengers here. And with how this goes, I like that for a moment, when we see Captain America helping the other Captain Americas while telling them keep up the good work Steves, we get this moment where Earth 76 Captain Carter, she just tells him, hey new guy, get back in formation. Cause to most of them, the heroes of Earth 616, they're the outliers. And also we get a moment between 616 Tony Stark and Earth 818 Tony Stark, where 818 Tony, the Ant-Man, tells 616 Tony, wow, I didn't know there was gonna be another Iron Man out here. I mean, I got sober for this. And 616 Tony tells him in response, like, oh, you were drunk, that explains it. It's the only reason I'd ever become Ant-Man. And it's kinda like, man, you just roasted that dude's whole life. And we're also shown for a brief moment that they haven't forgotten about Robbie Reyes as they go to dig him out of the wreckage since he was inside of Avengers Tower when Doom the Living Planet crashed into it. And speaking of the devil, as soon as they get Robbie out, another wave of Dooms come rushing in, along with Doom the Living Planet, who didn't just come here just to give these other Dooms a ride, cause he wants a piece of the action too. And as soon as he drops his molten lava attack, incinerating a number of the heroes, Star Panther then swoops in and flies straight through Doom the Living Planet's forehead, coming right out the other side. And he doesn't stop there, cause Star Panther circles back around, flying through him again, but this time coming out with his eye, which now creates an opportunity for Phoenix Wolverine and the Phoenix Maya Lopez to follow up with their attack now that he's weakened. And now when we go back over to the Doom Above All and Avenger Prime who are having their magic sword match with Namor getting his hits in here and there, I can't help but to think that the whole molten attack from Doom the Living Planet was done just to recreate what looks to be a bit of a Star Wars reference cause for a moment their silhouettes kinda give off the Anakin vs Obi-Wan vibes and it could be me just looking too deep into it but I also wouldn't put it past Marvel to just be making another Star Wars reference here. But instead of the Doom Above All telling Avenger Prime that he underestimates his power, he lets him know nothing on this rock can stop him. So Avenger Prime reveals that they're not standing on a rock anymore, which creates yet another opportunity for Namor to slide through and get his hits in. But before we go any further, it's here where we instead take a step back so we can get caught up with 616 Mephisto, who much like the Doom Above All, he's also had a bit of trickery up his sleeve which of course is to be expected. But it's here where we head to Earth 616 in the prehistoric past at the Genesis point, just moments after Avenger Prime called the heroes over to the God Quarry where we find 616 Mephisto asking Kid Thanos why he's still here. Cause if you guys remember just moments after Kid Thanos used the Black Skull symbiote, he went missing when the heroes removed it from him. And now that he's back, Mephisto's curious to know why. So Kid Thanos lets him know, but only after telling Mephisto that his masters of evil didn't turn out to be too masterful cause the ghost goblin's dead, the black skull was stripped of his symbiote, King Killmonger got his face beaten in by the iron fist, but with the dark phoenix in doom fleeing the timeline completely, now Kid Thanos can get what he was after all along, which was knowledge, in the form of a few fresh corpses for the dissection table. But Mephisto points out that the skull isn't quite dead yet. It is really one of those things where it's like, we know, that's not gonna stop Kid Thanos from cutting this guy open while he's still alive. He ain't stopped for his mother, what makes this guy special? And Kid Thanos goes on to ask Mephisto, since his plans to rewrite history have failed, why is it that he's not devastated? And also, does he plan on sticking around and taking on the Avengers by himself? Only for Mephisto to just laugh at the idea of fighting the Avengers alone as he makes his way back to the God Quarry, wishing Kid Thanos well on his quest for knowledge. But back over at the God Quarry, when 616 Mephisto gets there, he's met by what's left of the very upset Council of Red, 
who tell him that he lied to them because he told them that the resistance at the god quarry would be minimal only for them to get here and find the place flooded with avengers which now has them thinking that 616 mephisto deliberately lied to them and really the truth of the matter is he did <laughs> no seriously for the council of red this is a huge deal because for an organized group of mephistos they really don't have much of any rules but one of the few rules that they do have is that they can never lie to another mephisto and the council of red is more concerned about that than 616 mephisto leaving them high and dry so they tell him they took a vote and they're sentencing him to death but before they can fully get the whole sentence out to let him know 616 Mephisto takes advantage of the fact that all of these guys are weakened from their battle with the multiversal Avengers and he slaughters the remaining Mephistos from the council because also while these guys have been here fighting heroes from across the multiverse getting worn and tired and weaker while 616 Mephisto was away he was getting stronger which together just crafts this perfect storm so that when he came back he could just wreck these guys fairly easily because as it turns out, this was Mephisto's plan all along for him to be empowered by the ravaging of Earths, siphoning the essence from each of those ruined universes, all for this moment, so that he could destroy the Council of Red and absorb them into himself, which then makes Mephisto crazy huge. And in addition to Mephisto leaving the Council of Red here at the God Quarry to have this insanely crazy fight with the Multiversal Avengers, he did it so that their battle would crack the firmament of the God Quarry just so he could break it open with his bare hands and take that power for himself, which now is just like, man, there's a whole lot of backstabbing going on around here, which on one hand is expected from Mephisto, but for him to betray the Council of Red after all this time, it shows us that he's really been playing the long game because as it turns out, Mephisto, he doesn't want to rewrite all of existence. He wants to end it. And with us now seeing how his real plan is shaped up, it also shows us why he was laughing at the comment from Kid Thanos when he was asking if Mephisto was planning on fighting the Avengers alone. Because depending on how you look at it, he's not exactly alone because he's every Mephisto, it's all in him. So yeah, there's that. But next, when the Carol Corps comes after him with their helicarrier, he just chops the Carol Carrier down. But also with this concluding Avengers Volume 8, we're shown that the fight between Avenger Prime and the Doom Above All continues, which for a moment has Avenger Prime struggling for a bit, as 818 Tony Stark is calling out to him, hoping that Avenger Prime has still got another trick up his sleeve, because in addition to them facing the Doom Above All, they now got a giant sized Mephisto on their hands, as well as Doom the Living Planet, still causing trouble with his good eye. So Avenger Prime tells Tony that he's already called for more Avengers, and as soon as he says this, we get the arrival of Kazar, who has been MIA since Avengers issue 50. 16 issues, not even counting the tie-ins, which for us, that's months in comic book publication time. But with him coming back, he lets Captain America know. When he was lost in time, he ended up making a new friend and getting the power cosmic. Because like we saw in the epilogue for Avengers issue 50, Kazar is now the Savage Herald of Galactus. So naturally, with him answering the call, he brought Galactus with him, which now is really just the first of the last three additions to the Avengers army. Alright, so jumping back in in the moment where we saw Avenger Prime, the All-Loki, struggling in his matchup against the Doom Above All, like we saw when he told Earth-818 Tony Stark, he was already calling for others to join the fight while he was facing Doom, which is what then brought in the addition of Galactus and his Cosmic Herald Kazar, where again, like we talked about, these are callbacks to Avengers Issue 50, Legacy Issue 750. Which at the time, if you guys remember, that issue was super packed because Jason Aaron was just unloading a ton of different plot points for what we would see come back later on. And we're given more of that here with yet another on your left moment as Gorilla Man radios to Captain America that he's now arrived alongside of Ursa Major inside of the Deathlock possessed progenitor. And this is one of those things where I imagine you guys are on either side of the fence. Where on one side, you might be like, hey, better late than never. And on the other side, some of you just might be like, hey, better never than ever. And it could be the chance that some of you are seeing this and you're just completely confused. And if you are, I totally understand. So to make sense of this really quick, let's start with a Deathlock progenitor. Because this is something that's picking up from what we saw in the Death Hunters event when the Doom Above All attacked Avengers Mountain, we got Red Panther for a moment, and one of the Deathlocks who were with them, who were sent by Avenger Prime, failed at his attempt to awaken the progenitor just seconds before it exploded after the attack from the Doom Above All and Kid Thanos. And I have the link down below for the full story 
for anyone who may have missed it or needs to get caught up, because at the time we were teased with the idea of that Deathlock's consciousness laying dormant in the progenitor and eventually coming back in some capacity. But of course, before that happened, we got Judgment Day, which did its own thing for a while. But it also created the situation to where, when Judgment Day concluded, Avengers Mountain needed to be restored so that the events from the Death Hunters could continue and bring us here. And on top of that, with us seeing the return of Gorilla Man and Ursa Major, this actually goes a little further back to Avengers issue 46, I believe it was, back when Gorilla Man made this whole deal with Dracula, where he gave Dracula what he wanted. In return, Dracula was supposed to relieve Gorilla Man of his curse of immortality. But with him making this deal with both Dracula and the Winter Guard, Red Widow from the Winter Guard ended up betraying him by attempting to kill Ursa Major instead. And at the time, it looked like she actually did. But a few issues later, in the Super Pact Legacy issue 750, we found that Ursa Major was then in a coma recovering. And in the case of Gorilla Man, he had learned his lesson while also gaining a new appreciation for life. So jumping forward to now, this brings a number of things into play. Cause now that Ursa's better, both him and Gorilla Man are close and looking out for each other. And on top of Gorilla Man's new perspective on life, he's now joining the fight with all the other Avengers with the hopes of this being a step towards redemption. So yeah, that's the whole backstory to the Deathlock possessed progenitor showing up to the fight, which now brings us to this big moment where all the heroes come together with the addition of their special guests so that they can all let out one great big Avengers assemble. And it's kind of like on one hand, like, yeah, everybody here, you're an Avenger, no matter where you're from. But at the same time, you can see Galactus all the way up in the corner looking like, I'm just here because my Herald told me there's going to be something to eat. So as soon as everyone's finished with the Avengers assemble, Galactus goes after Doom the Living Planet. Just like that one person at Thanksgiving who can't wait till the prayer's done before they're reaching for some food, because that's Galactus here. Because there's no hiding the fact that he came here to eat and he just might take a plate. And also with all the heroes coming together, it's set up to be like this huge payoff for the people who have been reading all the stories leading up to this, whether it was Avengers Volume 8 with the stories of Avengers 1 million BC or Avengers Forever with all the different origin stories of the variant heroes from across the multiverse and even some of the stuff from Thor Volume 5 with us getting the return of Old Man Phoenix. This is Jason Aaron bringing all of this stuff together and not just for the purpose of this great huge battle, but also to tie up some loose ends. Because when it comes to the Avengers and especially Thor, Jason Aaron has had quite a few things floating in the air for a while. So you guys will notice much of that being cleaned up in these last couple of issues. But going back to the battle, we get this moment where Mephisto's pretty much just laughing at the whole Avengers assemble thing. And I don't blame him. But he goes on to tell the heroes that they're too late because as he continues to pound on the god quarry, the power from beneath is already seeping through, which is creating another problem that we'll talk about in a little bit. But it's right here with a deathlock progenitor lets off this huge blast, hitting Mephisto and taking a chunk out of his side, which lets us know like, okay, yeah, this guy, he's a huge help. But right after this happens, as we see Mephisto just eating his own guts, which are actually, if you look closely, the other Mephistos that he absorbed to get to this size. But as we see him eating them, he's just like Mephisto assembled. As he eats all these little Mephistos, gets back up with his health restored, and he's right back in the fight. And now it's kind of like, man, like I get it, but still, that's wild. And right now, with Avenger Prime being able to focus on the Doom above all, we find that he's been able to once again gain the upper hand. But it isn't long before the Doom above all lets him know that Mephisto was right about their whole Avengers assembling being a bit too late. Because right now, he's already begun to draw from the power seeping through the cracks of the God Quarry. Which then kind of gives us this reveal when Mystique the Dark Phoenix comes back, who again is highly pissed at the Doom above all for abandoning her in the Masters of Evil. But this quickly turns into this thing where we find out that there was a lot more going on between the two of them than we were led to believe throughout most of this. And it really doesn't lead into anything significant here as far as what these two have been doing. But Mystique returning to the fight, it does end up playing a significant role in just a moment. But before we get to that, we hop over to Robbie Reyes, the All Rider, and Brandy Selby, the Star Brand, who right now are both just kind of watching from the sideline while this whole chaotic battle goes down. Because like we saw up to this moment, both of them went through this evolution slash burnout in their own kind of way with Robbie needing time to recharge and Brandy having the whole situation to where the more she uses her powers, the faster she ages. And as they're sitting there talking and just watching, 
it comes to the point where they both pretty much realize that they've given too much to just sit back and watch now. So they both power up and head into the fight, knowing that it just might actually kill them. And in the case of Mystique, the Dark Phoenix, with her returning, this right here just shows how ridiculous Jason Aaron wants to be with this story. Because between the Dark Phoenix and Old Man Phoenix, as well as Maya Lopez Phoenix, all of whom who are really using the same Phoenix from different points in time, they all come together to face off, with it being Maya and Logan versus Mystique, of course. But just before they get into it, and Mystique is talking about how she's gonna drain their power as well. Just before they get into it, Mystique is hit from behind by this huge fireball that came from the Phoenix from the Avengers of 1 million BC. And now it's kinda like, okay. But really with seeing this, I truly believe that this is like the swan song to whatever it was Jason Aaron was intending to do with the whole build up to the Phoenix being Thor's mother. Cause like we saw, that mystery got derailed quite some time ago. Back in God of Hammers, I believe it was. And following that, we got the Avengers 1 million BC one shot that pretty much served the purpose of cleaning up the conspiracy by showing us that not only is Gia still Thor's mother, but it also went a bit further and added the extra touch, with us seeing baby Thor being frozen because of Lofi's attack, followed by the prehistoric phoenix saving him, in what was more or less a ceremony of rebirth, with baby Thor's revival that kept Thor's true mother as Gia, while still managing to include the phoenix into the equation. And I say that this feels like a swan song because when the prehistoric phoenix gets here, she's just marveling at how Thor is grown up now and how she's followed his sounds of thunder across the heavens. But I can't help but to think that there was a lot more that Jason Aaron wanted to do here that he just didn't get to. But from here this leads to the two of them combining their power, both fire and thunder, in an attack aimed at the dark phoenix that really looks like something the fire god Liu Kang would approve of. But when they strike Mystique with all of this power, she goes down, hitting the God Quarry and releasing even more of the entropy that Mephisto was after, which now more or less has him like, well, thanks, y'all saved me the work. And from here, he takes just a drop of it, which I mean, at his scale, it's just a drop. Cause I mean, he's calling it a drop, but he's already huge. But after absorbing this power, Mephisto grows even larger and more powerful to where now he's dwarfing the Deathlock Progenitor and Galactus as well. But this causes the heroes to come to the realization of what Mephisto has truly been after. Because with everything he's done up to this point, they believe that Mephisto wanted to get to the God Quarry so that he could rewrite all of existence, only to find out now that that's not the case. Because Mephisto would much rather destroy it all instead. And now with Mephisto powered up and the God Quarry compromised, releasing the ocean of dark power that contains the remains of the first firmament, this now puts us one issue away from the conclusion where we see who comes out on top. And that's either going to be the Avengers Mephisto or the doom above all. Alright, so coming back for the conclusion of Avengers Assemble, there's quite a few things that have compounded into this chaotic moment that I want to go over before we dive in. Cause right now at Infinity's End, the God Quarry's been broken open as the result of a number of things. Cause for starters, you got the fight here, which began with the army of Mephistos versus the multiversal Avengers that initially took its toll on the God Quarry. But then you stack on top of that, the Doom Above All and his army bringing their fight here, only to then have the Quarry pounded on by your super-sized Mighty Morphin Mephisto which was then followed by Thor and the Phoenix Force combining their power to knock the Dark Phoenix Mystique right into it, creating the opportunity for Mephisto to sample from the entropy leaking out and power himself up even further just so he could hit the God Quarry again, releasing the waters of entropy. Because as we're told, the God Quarry was actually a dam holding back the all-consuming waters of entropy, with these dark waters containing the rotting remains of the first firmament that at one time was the fertile compost that the Omniverse grew from. So yeah, heading into this conclusion, everything we've talked about leading up to here has brought us to the point of what could potentially be the end of everything. So those are the stakes that we're dealing with here. And right now, as the waters of entropy come spewing up out of the bedrock, just about everyone is making a run for it. Cause if enough of this stuff gets on you, you're done, or better yet, undone. And I say that just about everyone's making a run for it because it's right here where we see 616 Captain America racing right into the danger, telling the other Avengers to gather the wounded and get them to higher ground, which really I wouldn't expect him to do any different in this situation. And right away, 616 Iron Man lets him know that there is no higher ground and what they need to do is get everyone here to Avengers Mountain and teleport out of here, only for Odin to tell them both that there's no running from this, cause this flood will sweep across realities, drowning civilizations, planets, and universes. 
which then has Cap like, well, okay, well, how do we stop it? As he does parkour around these crashing death waves. But all he hears in return is radio silence, because no one has that answer. So 616 Cap just continues to do what he can by helping those closer to the breach get further away from it. And as he does, we see him save the dog Steve Rogers that we were introduced to in Avengers Forever issue 7. But as he saves him, we're given another example of what the dark waters can do on contact, as some of it splashes on Cap's shield, melting it away. And with the waves literally splashing on his heels, a huge wall of Phoenix fire comes through, separating the dark water from the rest of the heroes, so they look up to see old man Phoenix holding the waves back as he looks down and tells them, whatever they plan to do, make it quick, because even the Phoenix Force can't hold this back for long. But just after this, we go back over to Mephisto for a moment, where in his case, we quickly find out that he wasn't able to sustain the immense amount of power that he acquired when he sampled the raw entropy from the God Quarry, which is something that I would have liked to have seen a bit more of as far as the overpowered Mephisto wreaking havoc. But I also imagine at some point, Jason Aaron was being told to wrap it up and that's why we didn't get too much of it. But also the concept is understandable as far as Mephisto not being able to control omniversal entropy because by definition, it's unpredictable. So I get that. But as Mephisto returns to his regular form, he's approached by the Doom Above All who pretty much rubs it in his face while telling Mephisto the only reason he wanted to erase all of reality was because he couldn't control the power anyway, which on the surface seems like a valid assumption. But instead of just letting Doom Supreme think what he wants to think, Mephisto opens up here and he tells Doom the true reason why he wanted to erase everything. And the truth is, Mephisto's tired because he's been reigning in hell longer than humanity's been alive. And sure, over the eons, he's had his moments of enjoyment, like at the sight of a sniveling lecherous priest being flayed alive. But he goes on to tell Doom Supreme that hell makes slaves of us all. Sooner or later, even the devil who sits on the throne, which is why I decided to free myself from the monotony of eternal damnation once and for all. After this flood sweeps across creation, there will be no more life, no more afterlife. No more sinners or saints to make scream and suffer. Nothing but grand and glorious silence. Stretching into infinity. How beautiful it will be. Which, yeah, that was Mephisto's motive for all of this from the beginning. And though I don't agree with Mephisto's actions with everything that's brought us here, I felt that speech. He got the tears coming down, Mephisto may cry out here. You can tell he needed to get this off his chest. So the Doom Above All gives him a bit of help with that by blasting through Mephisto's back and out of his chest the remaining portion of the entropy that Mephisto wielded while telling Mephisto, okay, long story short, you wish to die, I got you. But before you go, gaze upon the man who will embrace all that made the devil himself cower. This power you have unleashed in great quantities, it overwhelms and destroys, but in controlled doses, it can be harnessed and wielded. I sympathize Mephisto with your detesting of mankind's tedium. Which is why, after I have used this power to remake the multiverse, only Doom will remain. But before Doom can make use of the entropy, it grows exponentially after being hit by Stark particles that were compliments of the Ant-Man from Earth-818, who was like, oh, my bad, looks like your controlled dose suddenly turned into one of those great quantities that overwhelms and destroys, and it's enough to make a 616 Tony proud, as he tells him, good job, Ant-Me, as the Doom Above All just turns to stone, like the rest of the gods here. So 818 Tony shrinks him down and picks him up, and he looks at Mephisto like, okay, you're next. But as it stands right now, they really don't have the time to worry about Mephisto, because they still need to seal the breach in the God Quarry. And even now with the Avenger Prime Loki and Agamotto himself trying to seal it, the power of the first firmament refuses to yield. And also, even with the Doom Above All defeated, his army is still fighting. So really, the war continues while they're still trying to find a solution to save the Omniverse from oblivion. Because right now, Old Man Phoenix is still trying to keep the waves at bay while this insane power is causing his adamantium bones to buckle. And even now with Valkyrie using the all weapon to hold Old Man Phoenix together, this still isn't a permanent solution. So they've got to figure out something quick. And the next thing we see is the Deathlock Progenitor, Avengers Mountain, step forward to give them a hand, literally, by placing his hand right on top of the opening. But almost immediately, the insane amount of power begins to tear him apart. So Thor and the goddesses of Thunder, Iron Man, and Starbrand, they all jump in and attempt to cauterize the wounds in real time. But even still, the Deathlock Progenitor is tearing apart so quickly that it's clear to them that this ain't gonna do it either. 
Meanwhile, Maya Lopez and the Phoenix Avatar from 1 million BC, they're both attacked by Raven, the Dark Phoenix, who just dunks the both of them into the entropy juice. <laughs> but because it's been established that this won't kill a Phoenix right away, we're given this brief moment while they're under where the prehistoric Phoenix tells Maya to focus on the thing that she cherishes and use it because the Phoenix Force is a force of chaos, of change, of unquenchable passion. The Phoenix is a force of love, which right there I imagine quite a few people are going to find that statement controversial, which is fine, but I also believe that there's more information over the history of the Phoenix that supports it. If you just look at the Phoenix for what it is, the spark of creation, the cycle of life, death and rebirth, it checks out. But I can't help but to add here that I believe this is still us seeing some of the signs of what Jason Aaron intended to do with the Phoenix being Thor's mother and how that got scaled back over the past couple of years. And it leads me to believe that maybe Jason Aaron was hoping to lean into more of the life and rebirth aspects of the Phoenix Force, which we've only really seen from Chris Claremont and Grant Morrison, because most of the time when we see the Phoenix Force, it's just about death and destruction. So maybe Jason Aaron was trying to balance that out. I'm just guessing, because at this point, it's just one of those things where it's like, I guess we'll never know. But nonetheless, it's this ideology that the prehistoric Phoenix uses alongside of Maya Lopez to overpower Raven and tear off her wings, which then sends her plummeting into the entropy. Meanwhile, with the Deathlock Progenitor, he's forced to let go after nearly losing his hand. And I mean, at one point, someone says that he lost his hand, but it's not actually gone. It's just really, really messed up. So the prehistoric Phoenix and Maya Lopez jump in to help Old Man Phoenix, but they're weakened because of their battle with Mystique. So the prehistoric Phoenix is like, oh, we need more fire. So fire god Thor Odinson steps in using the flames he was gifted on the day he was born. The fire of the mighty Thor, son of the Thunderbird, which I mean at this point I don't need to say too much about that. But right now with them still needing a permanent solution, this causes both Robbie Reyes and Brandy Selby to go back and forth on which one of them it's going to be to sacrifice everything to get this done. Cause like we saw before, it's pretty much curtains for the both of them. So Robbie Reyes, the all rider, he just steps forward and reassembles what's left of Doom the Living Planet and sends it right down into the breach. Cause also around this time, you had some of these guys asking like, what happened to Galactus? And Kazar tells them, Galactus dipped out. Soon as he saw the dam broke, he just went back to his own time. Like what, the end of the universe? Not doing this again. But right now, with Robbie plugging this leak with a moon-sized flaming planet, only to see it begin to break up, which Mephisto's not mad about cause he wants it all to end anyway. But right here, Avenger Prime Loki realizes the reason why nothing's working is because nothing from this side can hold back that energy. So if they want to stop this, the solution has to come from the other side. So Valkyrie and all the Thors get all the hammers to hold Doom the Living Planet together just a little bit longer as Brandy Selby comes forth saying, okay, that's it. She's ready to go in there and do what needs to be done. But like we saw before, Brandy, she's literally still just a child. So Robbie Reyes beats her to the punch again. And he first tells Captain America and Captain Marvel to take care of his brother Gabe. As he takes off and Brandy tries to race him to it while telling Robbie that this is why she's here, it has to be her, only for Robbie to tell her that it isn't. And no one can outrace the All Rider. So Robbie just goes full speed through the doom above all, through the breach, into the abyss, on some stand up in the motor busted dashboard type mess, full speed, to break up the bedrock from the other side. And it works, because Robbie Reyes, the All Rider, made the ultimate sacrifice to save all of existence. And we also get this moment where Nighthawk just punches Mephisto while telling him, yeah, I wanted to do that for a long time. Like he might as well have just said that was for Heroes Reborn Volume 2, because we know what you really mean. And next, Akamoto sends Mephisto off to the last place that he wants to go, which is back to his realm, back to hell. Which now has Mephisto feeling like, man, this is a lot worse than it was before. Because this time when he returns to his throne, he finds Orb sitting right there with him. Who like we saw, this guy died back in issue 50 of Avengers. And now that he's dead and here in hell, he has someone to talk to for eternity. But back at Infinity's End, when it comes to the rest of the heroes, there's a number of solutions that need to be made. Because for all the variants who had their timelines altered back when the Masters of Evil were hunting down their prehistoric Avengers, their worlds have been changed and those changes made them the heroes that they are. So for a moment they go back and forth on whether they should fix it and pretty much undo themselves, which is something that Weapon America wouldn't mind. But for others like this Steve Rogers, who spent most of his life jumping from one nervous hospital to another, he doesn't want to go back to that. So the heroes from other worlds, they take a moment here to figure out what their next step's gonna be and what that looks like. Meanwhile, the prehistoric Phoenix, she steps over to the side to have a conversation with Brandy Selby, the star brand who now that everything's over, she really doesn't know what her purpose is. But a few things happen here in this moment, because for one, you have the Deathlock Celestial, 
who's feeling a bit of a guilt trip for him playing his part on helping Brandy get to this point, but she more or less just tells him to save his tears. So what ends up happening here, much like the conclusion of Heroes Reborn and Heroes Return, when Brandy Selby had to team up with Maya Lopez to combine the power of the Starbrand and the Phoenix to change things back to normal, we pretty much get the same thing happening here. Cause as it turns out, after all this time, this is Brandy's purpose, which makes for a rather sad moment. Cause on one hand, Maya Lopez is like, no, it's supposed to be me. Why can't I take her place? Cause this time around, they're resetting more than just one earth because the masters of evil conquered and altered 615 earths before making their way to earth 616. So now with this happening again, but on a much larger scale, it now just causes everyone to assume that this is the end for the prehistoric Phoenix and Brandy, though we're not given a definitive answer to that. But we are told that even with them resetting these different 615 Earths, it doesn't undo the heroes at the God Quarry. They still remain, which again is just like what we saw in Heroes Reborn and Heroes Return, because after that was done, we still got Nighthawk alongside of the Squadron Supreme that we were given from that story. But nonetheless, with Old Man Phoenix seeing this happen, he sheds a tear and bids them farewell. And after that, the Avengers 1 million BC return back to their time in the prehistoric era of Earth 616. And as they do, a now blind Agamotto creates multiple eyes to see for him since he no longer has his natural sight. And with doing this, he looks forward into the future, seeing things like the age of heroes, as well as mutants coming of age, having powers that defy the imagination, which for the most part, these are things we've seen in the comics for the past 70 years that Agamotto's looking forward at and seeing for the first time. But as he leaves this cave with a prehistoric Iron Fist and Moon Knight, we get a glimpse at the cave paintings that'll later become an Easter egg for a previous issue. And as we go to Asgard, still one million years in the past, we see Odin set down Mjolnir and swear that he'll never use the hammer again, which in this case just sets things up for the future where a young Thor would often come here and admire the hammer before he could lift it. And speaking of the future, from here we head into the far future, the home of the goddesses of thunder, where it's here on the Midgard that was restored by King Thor's blood. We find that the goddesses of thunder have already returned all the hammers from across the multiverse to their rightful worlds. So now in new Midgard, they all just kind of share Mjolnir and for the most part, things go back to normal for them. But aside from that, the new addition that we get here is that old man Phoenix has now made his home here. He's pretty much just relaxing and gardening with his adamantium claws while speaking to old King Thor through the earth that King Thor is more or less a part of now since it was restored with his blood. And for a moment, old man Phoenix speaks of the days of him using the Phoenix Force as a thing of the past. So as it would seem from this point going forward, he's no longer an avatar which is undoubtedly the case for Maya Lopez, who we find in the present day with Thor in Asgard, as Thor introduces her to his two mothers after she fought alongside of him to save all of reality. And after this, staying in the present day, we see Nighthawk continuing his search for the Squadron Supreme, though he's not really sure of how much time he has left or if he'll fade from existence. So in the meantime, he's just gonna continue as Marvel's We Got Batman at Home. And in the case of Namor, he ends up turning himself in and serving time at Seagate Prison for pretty much everything he did in Avengers Volume 8 leading up to the Death Hunters event when he joined the Avengers to make things right. But when everything's said and done, they're like, nah, bro, you still going to jail. <laughs> it's kind of wild. And it's really messed up because helping to save all of existence, you would think that would earn you a reduced sentence or better yet, avoid jail time. But nah, not for Namor. He still gets locked up, which he agrees to go along with for now. And next, when we head over to the North Pole, where Avengers Mountain used to be, now that it's gone, we find all the heroes are gathered here alongside of Gabe Reyes, Robbie's little brother, to pay their respects to Brandy Selby and Robbie Reyes, who they've created this monument for, so that they'll always be remembered, for giving the ultimate sacrifice to save all of existence. But just after this, when we head over to Valkyrie, we find that she's made an interesting discovery, or really it's what she didn't discover that's interesting. Cause for her, after searching the afterlife for Brandy and Robbie, she couldn't find either one of them in any heaven or hell, which for a moment had her concerned about their eternal rest situation until Mr. Horse tells her that it's likely because they're still alive somewhere waiting to be reborn. And from here, we then head over to Infinity's End with the Deathlock Progenitors now serving a new purpose by going back to work with Avenger Prime. But this time he's serving as a base of operations and helping the remaining variants to make their way out to the different 615 worlds to pretty much patrol and do reconnaissance while reporting back to Avenger Prime, which these guys are more than happy to do because they feel like they owe it to the Phoenix and the Star Brand for resetting their worlds and sparing them in the process. 
which from here kind of gives us the ending of the story. But before it's completely done, we do get a bit of a post credit scene because the last thing that we're shown takes place far under the God Quarry, where we see the pieces of the Hell Charger being collected by chains and brought together as the All Rider rebuilds his vehicle and waits for the opportunity to take one more ride, which is the long ride home so he can get back to his little brother Gabe. So yeah, it's a lot of stuff to process here, but this is effectively the ending of Avengers Volume 8, Avengers Forever Volume 2, and Avengers Assemble. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.